Hi, good morning. <laughs> Hi, Sonia. Good morning. Good I was morning. just babbling about you already. <laughs> oh, really? Only <laughs> good things, I hope. <clears throat> of course, always good things. <laughs> How are you guys? How's everybody doing? <laughs> Welcome, welcome. Um, very exciting. Should we give it one more minute? Maybe? Yeah. <laughs> it's 10 o'clock on the dot now. It is, huh? Yeah. I'm trying to open my vitamin water and it just won't open. It's so dark here. <laughs> hey, Sonia, I like your new office setup. That's a, that's a cool <laughs> backdrop. Yeah. <laughs> You know, um, I've been on so many Zoom calls lately, and now everybody, you know how you can actually change what it says on the screen for your name. And so whatever Zoom call I'm on, they always have you like, okay, if you're the instructor, write instructor, Sonia, or if you're such and such attendee, yes, whatever. So they're always having me change it. So I got kind of tired of it. So then that's why I made that one <laughs> happen. But, yeah. yeah, cool. All right, you want to take it away and then I can hop on or? Yeah, let's uh, a brief. So just to make it official, welcome to another introductory se session of California Real Estate Training uh, online slash in-class uh, session. Um, we offer an online <clears throat> real estate course where you are able to get all the certificates needed to apply for your real estate license and the California state exam. Um, so welcome. This is, uh, we usually meet in our classroom in Torrance, California in uh, the South Bay. Um, and now because of the office closures, we are <laughs> conducting via Zoom. And <clears throat> I don't know how long more this is gonna go. And typically I'm, I'm the instructor for this uh, session in, in the South Bay and I conduct the classes on Saturday. And Sonia here is the productivity coach in my uh, real estate office. She's the one that will help the new agents get going ASAP and get you guys making a shit ton of money. So Sonia would like to say a few words uh, just to tell her about what it's like. So Sonia. Awesome. Here. Yeah, welcome everyone. Um, some of you guys I've been in contact with, some some not yet. And so um, typically when you guys send uh, some requests for information and things like that to the Keller Williams offices, I'm usually the one that it, it lands on. And so uh, because I'm helping everybody who's newly licensed get going as quickly as possible. So my entire goal at our office is to just make you get you making money immediately so that you don't go through a long wait, right? Because it can be uh, months sometimes if you don't know what you're doing to get your first paycheck. And we don't want that because we know that people will end up leaving the business if they don't start making some money, right? We all have to make some money. So um, <clears throat> yeah, so that's basically my one and only goal at our office. So when you start going, so this, this, you're going to take these classes, right? And uh, when you do test your, you get your licensing done, your testing done, right after that, what happens is you need to pick a brokerage, right? So if you are interested in joining, for instance, my coaching program, which is completely free, not all offices have that, um, then you can choose Keller Williams South Bay. We've got two offices. We are in uh, Torrance and we are in um, the Riviera Village as well. So you have some location options. Um, and <clears throat> once you do that, it takes a few days to get all of your logins to all the different technology that you get uh, with, with the brokerage. And so you're gonna get like your websites. You can actually make however many websites as you want um, with our tech and uh, you'll get all of your, your keys, your different apps that you need. And once you have that stuff, then it, we're in actual business and we can actually sit down and make a plan. So <clears throat> real estate is all about math. It really is. So it's just a numbers game. People think that, oh, I'm, you know, I'm good at talking to people or I, I have a lot of friends or I have a lot of good contacts. That's great if you do, and yet we still have to cultivate them. 
because no one's going to sign a contract with you unless you sit down with them and talk to them about it. So we have to know what, what things to say and, and how to go about all of this. So um, is there who's in here today that has not been on one of these classes yet at all? You can put it in a chat box or you can just yell, I. <laughs> Michelle, I am. Hi, perfect. Hi. Perfect. Awesome, guys. So, um, perfect. So, so we do this. I come in like every so and so often. Hi, Adam. Perfect. So, um, every every first weekend of the month that you guys have this class, I'll be here just because that's the day that the new new people will start on these courses as well. So Hope will walk you through how it's going to go um, in terms of the licensing, if you have any questions on that. But what I wanted to show you is how we can make some money. So I just want to talk to you about what kind of, um, how do we actually make the money? How do we goal ourselves? And how do the commissions break down for you? Okay, so I'm just going to, um, I'm joining here on my iPad as well. So you'll see double of me here in a second, but uh, I just wanna make sure that I can, oops. Ho, are you there? Sorry, did he step out? <clears throat> Hi, Lucy. What happened? Will you make me able to share my screen? Yeah, let me see. <clears throat> just so that I can show you guys. Um, First class as well. Awesome. How about now? Okay, let's see. Yep, got it. <clears throat> All right, guys. So I am going to share this here. So I'm just using this uh, little paper pen here. So, uh, so you can all see. All right. So when we first start uh, <clears throat> going in real estate, uh, let's go ahead and just do a new one here. What happens is we need to figure out how much money we need to actually make, right? So a lot of the conversations that I have with the agents is, is okay, what do, you, what do you need to make, right? What do you want to make? What do you need to make? And then we also plan for the future so that one day when the day comes that you don't want to or you no longer can work, uh, that you have money coming your way. So basically we do a little plan called the LID, okay? So it's L-I-D, L, this is your lifestyle, Okay, so how much does it cost to be you every year? So let's just say your lifestyle is, it costs you $100,000 to just to be you, uh, keep the lifestyle that you have, whatever that number is for you, you, you would mark that there, okay? The I is gonna be your investments, right? And this is, if, if it costs you $100,000 to be you every year, how do you make sure that when you retire, you have $100,000 coming at you from your investment so that you can keep being you? So in other words, we're going to plan, okay, for instance, is this maybe your uh, investment properties, right? Properties are a great way to, to bring in money. Um, and then how much is it going to take for all of these, right? So let's just say that you need to have 100000 coming at you and you have a 10% in, um, return on investment on these things. So we need to figure out how many properties you need, right? And at what price point. So if whatever, if you're buying some $500,000 properties, okay, well, the first one, if this is 500,000 somewhere, you, you're buying an investment condo somewhere that you can rent out, for instance. Okay, so the first one, uh, well, or the first one might be your own house, right? So that one, you're going to need just three and a half percent down for that because you're going to live in it. But then the other ones, you might need 20% down because you have to get a conventional loan for things that you don't live in. So now what does that look like, right? So if it's a, a $500,000 house, you're going to need 100K down here, right? So now we all of a sudden we realize that, well, okay, we don't not only, we, we not only need to make 100K every year that you're working in real estate, but we need to be building up these, monies right so that we can keep putting those buying those while you're still working so that when you do not work anymore you have money coming in right and then the d over here so this is my lid right so d is your debt of course the biggest portion here is taxes 
right? Tax, um, mortgages will also go in here, but there's there's good debt and bad debt, right? So good debt is going to be mortgages because this is going to give you a return on your investment. Your bad debt is going to be your, your things that aren't paying you anything, right? So <clears throat> there you go. So basically you and I will all, will all sit down and we're going to make an actual financial plan for you because I always ask people on my first time with them, I say, okay, well, how much money would be, what would be a great number? What would be so awesome if you could make that number, um, you know, during, during this, uh, this first year, in your first year, your first year in this career. And everyone always says what? Who can guess? <laughs> Everyone always says $100,000, okay? And so when we look at that, let's just go ahead and, and we'll just pretend that that was your number. So you may wanna make more, you may wanna make less, but the reason I laugh is because everyone always says 100K. And when we break that down in our, oh, 1 million, yeah, that's a little better. But here's the deal, right? We have to break this down. Like I said, it's just a numbers game. 100 grand may seem crazy to you in your head, or it might seem like nothing if you've made that money before. Uh, but but it's, all, it's all in the mentality. It's all in the mindset. Because, you know, we can actually make 100 grand very easily here. So I'm going to break this down for you guys. Uh, or even a mil we can do it on a million too, so you guys can see. But it you'll see how your perception changes once you actually break it down. So when you sell a house, so our average price point in this area is usually somewhere between seven fifty and nine fifty every month. It varies a little bit, right? And the reason it's under that million, even though we're right next to all these multi million dollar properties is because right now there's just more buyers, right? You guys know it's a seller's market. There's hardly any inventory out there. And what that means is when you have a buyer, well, they might want to buy anywhere, right? Or they might want to buy an investment property for, you know, their family. They might want to, you know, so you're not going to control where they buy. They might want to buy a $400,000 condo somewhere. And so that, that it, it will pull the price point down. If we only took the listings that we have, yes, we would be up way over a million. So when I do this math with somebody, especially with someone who's just getting going in the business, not to say you can't take listings, you 100% can and you should, but there's just more buyers. So those are inevitably going to be landing on your lap easier. Okay. And um, so, so we're going to call this, we're going to say that our first, the, the, this transaction that we're going to do, okay, um, <clears throat> is going to be a $600,000 house. All right. So when you're on a $600,000 house, right, if you represent the seller, the owner of the home, you make three and a half percent in commission. Okay. And if you represent the buyer or buyers, my stick figure buyers, then you make two and a half percent. Okay. Whoever takes the listing decides what everybody makes. So if you're the listing agent, you're going to take this listing and you're going to tell the seller, hey, Mr. Seller, it's going to cost you 6% total. The seller's going to pay both sides. So I'm only going to make the three and a half percent from you. And the buyers, we have to pay the buyer's agent two and a half percent. All right. It's a little more on the listing side because you're taking some risks here, right? You're going to be the one doing the marketing. You're going to be the one that's, you know, paying for pho photography for the home. So if this property does not sell, you are out that money, right? So we always want to make sure that we get a qualified and uh, we qualify the sellers at their, their uh, motivation to sell and all that other stuff. All right. So now let's just break this down into numbers. So three and a half percent of this is actually $21,000, right? And this is 15. So let's just say for average's sake, right? We don't know in your first year if you're gonna have more listings or more buyers. So we can just go right down the middle here and call your average percentage 3%, right? So this is gonna be $18,000. Okay, everyone with me? Stop me if you have questions, feel free by the way. Um, <clears throat> okay, so now we're gonna go to the brokerage. So out of this 18,000 that you're gonna get the check for, so they actually pay the broker that, right? And then the broker pays us. So out of this money, 70% goes to you, okay? And 30% 
goes to what we call company dollar, right? This keeps the, the, everything running for you. Um, and some companies will take a percentage of your sale or a flat fee from each one of your sales. Doesn't matter if you sell five homes or if you sell 500 homes every year, they'll just, every transaction, they'll take something, right? We don't, Keller Williams, we don't do that. We have something called a cap, okay? Cap is something that every time you you pay this 30%, that amount goes into towards your cap. And once you hit the cap number, then you're done. Then you make 100% of this commission. Okay, so the cap in our office is 23,500. All right, so if you're selling $600,000 homes and 3% of this is, I think it's like, let's, I mean, I'm sorry, 30% uh, of this is about five something, right? Five, eight, 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 or something like that. Okay, and so <clears throat> the 5,000 would go in here and now you would only owe the 17 something, right? Something like that, that just to give you a, an, an example, right? So every time you close something, it goes towards the cap and then you only owe something, something. So it usually takes about four transactions. And then after that, you're done, you make 100% of your money. Um, so my goal is to get you to cap as quickly as possible so that you can get those transactions in. And then for the rest of the year, you're gonna just be collecting more money. And that's when your income really goes up. Okay, and so um, I bring this in because I want to make sure that we're planning for this as well. So this is a cost of sale. It's not an expense. It's it's a cost of sale. You only pay if you're closing something. If you don't close anything, you don't pay anything. Okay, so you're never going to owe any money or anything like that. All right. Questions on this? I know when someone first told me this, I was very like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so I get it, it may go I know I'm going very fast but we'll come back to this when you guys are getting done with your licensing so you can fully understand everything okay thanks good all right so now back to your 100,000 and 1 million that you want to make right so first of all we want to go profit first anyone read that book profit first great book okay so profit so you want to make 100,000 so does that actually mean that you want to keep that because taxes are going to go out of there right right? So let's just say that you need to make 150 to keep the 100. Okay. So um, 150 is your goal. And then we also want to put the 23.5 in here because you still, you want to actually keep that and not pay the 23.5 out of there too, the cap. So we can just add it in, right? So now we're looking at 1735 if you guys want to keep your 100. If you just want to make a 100, uh, different story. All right, <clears throat> so we take 173.5, your goal number, whatever this might be, okay? And then we're gonna take this and we're going to divide it by the 3%, which was the 18,000 on average, all right? So that is 9.6 transactions, guys. Can you sell 9.6 homes? No, you gotta sell 10, <laughs> all right? So now you got to sell 10 homes, 10. You guys realize that someone in Alabama has to sell 100 homes to make that same amount of money. Seriously, it's really simple here. Simple. Well, let's make it, let's make it one a month. Uh, one a month, right? Yep. So the next thing we want to do is whenever we talk about a year and that's exactly right. Ho. So, we, we, so you always want to, whatever month you're starting on, you're not going to go, Oh, January to December, right? You're going to go from here, from this month to, to the next, next year, the same month. What does that look like? So if your goal is 10, you might as well make it 12, right? One a month to be even and to know what you're supposed to be doing. Okay. So, so th this is 12 transactions. So this actually means that you're going to make more than that, right? So you're you're when you're doing twelve transactions, you're actually up to about two hundred and twenty or something like that in terms of your actual, you know, what you're making. And then, of course, taxes are going to come out of that. So, if we look at this twelve, what does that actually mean for you guys? So what it means is we need to know what we actually have to do. I'm just changing colors here so we can keep track of where we are. So, twelve transactions. So one a month. And what does that mean? One closing a month? No. You can say one closing a month. That's great. But you do you control if it closes or not, right? So we want to focus on the things that we actually control. So one contract signed, right? That's the part you can control. As long as you're getting one contract signed a month, 
they will close, will help you close them, <laughs> All right? But you gotta get the contract signed, that's where it starts. And then it will, they will, all the transactions will have different types of closing timelines, right? Some people close faster, some people close, take longer. Um, so one contract signed per month, okay? So what does that look like for you on a daily, daily basis, right? So if your goal is to do one contract a month, <clears throat> the NAR, what's the NAR guys? Anyone know? National Association of Realtors, right? The NAR said that we need to make 35 contacts to get one good lead, right? And then they said, but you know what? You really need three leads to get one appointment. And then you probably need two appointments to get one contract signed. So there's your math. Remember I said it's a numbers game. One contract signed. All right, so what does this look like? One contract signed a month. So this is, by the way, this is based off statistics, right? They take the entire national averages from everything that the realtors have said that they've done and they've taken these numbers together. The good news is that there's a lot of realtors out there who don't do anything or don't know what they're doing. And what that means is your averages might actually be better than these numbers because they're just taking the lower, right? It, they're pulling the averages down because there's the 80% of the realtors are not doing much. And then the 20% are selling 80% of the real estate. So um, <clears throat> it's the 80, 20 rule. So we've got 35 contacts to one lead. Okay, so your goal is one contract sign. So let's, let's back this up. This means that, well, you know that you need to, to go on two appointments a month. That's a given. And then for every appointment, you need three leads. So really you need six good leads a month. That's following me. And then uh, six times 35 contacts is 210 contacts a month. Contacts, what's a contact? This is a two-way conversation between two people with real estate included in it, right? So you're talking to your friend and you're going, how are you, what's going on? Are you, in wor are you working right now? I know times are weird, blah, 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 blah. How's your family, um, you know? And then you talk to them, you're having a regular conversation and then all of a sudden your friend's gonna go, yeah, 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 well, what about you? How are you doing? Are you working? Oh yeah, you know, I actually just got licensed in real estate. Um, by the way, do you know of anybody who might be looking to buy or sell or invest in real estate that I could call? And your friends are going to help you get somebody. We're not going to like go around harassing our friends, right? Because <laughs> they're going to hate you. But we're going to ask them, who do they know? And it's almost like you really only need to know six people, right, to get to everyone in the world. So your friends are going to be your army, your friends, family, your sphere of influence, people you might know from your current work, um, that kind of thing. And we'll help you get all of that going, right? But here you are. So isn't this crazy? Remember, we're doing the 200 and something a year, right? So how long does it take to go on an appointment? What do you guys think? How long? It could be how long does it take to go on an appointment? You mean while you're, you have someone already? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. It can take a week to, I mean, it, one appointment it's immediate, right? If you have a contact and they're interested, it's immediate if you're a good salesperson. Yeah, so you could literally do an appointment in one hour, right? Right. Okay, so if we're here, we're actually on a two hour work week <laughs> or work month, right? So this is where in real estate, you know, what you put in comes back to you, right? And, and, and yet we wanna be purposeful because in reality, it only takes an hour to do an appointment with someone, right? Or to, to you know, right. personally for me, if I sit down and I call contacts, it's like impossible not to get an appointment if I call for two hours. It's, it's, you can go on a coffee date with someone, right? An appointment is not you going to uh, necessarily interview for a listing, right? It, it, I think a lot of a lot of agents getting into this business, they think, okay, I'm only going to go meet with people if they're like actually already doing something. But in reality, you're just trying to see if you even have any business to do together, right? If you if somebody knows someone, or you know, these guys are thinking about something, it's it's our job to go and educate them about you know whatever they're asking. 
And so, so those are appointments. As long as you're talking about real estate, you know, you can count this as an appointment. I don't care if it's at a pizza hut or, you know, coffee shop or wherever. It does not have to be in a shiny office. So, um, so it, that's great, right? So now, but, you know, being purposeful about it though, right? So you got two appointments, you need six leads. How do we get, how are we going to get leads? And then the contacts. So 200 contacts, remember this is per month. So if you're working, let's just say you month is four weeks roughly, and you're working only five days, right? You got 20 work days. So if we take 210 and we divide it by 20 days, that's 10.5 contacts a day, meaning 11. Can you guys make 11 phone calls a day? Absolutely. 100%, right? You absolutely can. So now when we say, I want to make $200,000, it's 11 phone calls a day. And it's not always glamorous, but it is math. And I would bet that if you do this, you're going to do even more than that. You're going to do even more than that. Because remember, these numbers are a little skewed. So it's really about grit and grind. And you just have to be disciplined in this business to, to make sure that you're, you know, you don't put anything above that 11 phone calls or, or contacts or door knocking or, or when you're talking to people, right? Nothing goes before that because this is your goal. And if when you let people get in the way of you making your calls or whatever, you're never going to get to your goal. And now you're going to go, oh, God, this is taking forever. I don't like this, right? And so this is the foundation. So we always want to build the foundation first, and then we're going to get creative later, right? So the graph is going to look like this. Oops. Right? Here's your foundation. And here's your creativity. So, so when you go the opposite way, you're going to have a very shaky, shaky business. And this is what, this is what happens when people go, Oh, I need the best marketing. I want sparkling everything. I need blah, blah, blah. No, you just need a phone. <laughs> you need a phone. You need the will. You need to be determined and you need to protect your time. And these are the things that really come in coaching. So, you know, my conversations are going to be goal setting with you, but they're also going to be okay. What happened? Did we get to 11 contacts? Because the conversations that I have, the, the agents who call me, they go, oh, I just don't know what I'm doing. I don't, I don't know. Maybe this isn't for me. Uh, I'm like, I need to make some money. Things are terrible. Uh, whatever. Right. My husband is out of work and now, you know, I need to bring, bring in some money. What should I do? Okay. So did we do the calls? No. Okay. What got in your way? right what happened and so really a lot of my conversations are about mindset and really focusing on why do we need to make that 200,000 which is why we go over these these conversations here because in the world of real estate the day that you sell your last house is the last time you get paid unless you also have been planning for that stuff right so we want to make sure that we're we're we're, we're doing a full big picture Right. And then now if you get this going, right. And I promise you guys, you guys can all do 11 contacts a day, 100%. Even if you know, no one, by the way, I pay for leads for all of you as well. Right. And, and I'm like, I can, I can get you those 11 names every single day. If you need them from me, if you don't have your own contacts here, because sometimes, right. Sometimes maybe people move in from out of the area or anything like that. That's fine. You, we can, you can still do this 100%. Um, <clears throat> where do I, yeah, going through the contacts. So that's, that's what I'm, great question. Um, so if you do not have contacts, we're going to keep building the database up and we'll help you with that. So what this means after this basic, so anyone can do that as long as you're with like a brokerage, right? And someone breaks it down for you like that. But then where this stuff really comes in is is when you start to have these conversations now you're gonna you're gonna have to like have the skill so if we measure what we're doing and you come to me and you say sonia i've been making my 11 contacts and nothing's happening okay great can we double down on that and see if if maybe you just need to make a few more uh you know to get there or is there a skill missing because you can't improve upon anything you don't measure. So we always want to know what exactly did we do so that I, we can 
problem solve that, right? So let's just say that then, then you're making 22 contacts. You told me to double down. I've been making my 22 calls and nothing's happening. I guarantee you, you're never going to have that conversation, by the way. But if you did, then we would know that you're missing a skill. Maybe you are not closing at all. You don't have the right script to say. You don't know how to handle people's objections. Or maybe you just, you, you, your attitude is terrible when you're meeting with people and they're just scared of you because you're in a suit and you're like, sign here, right? And now they're like, oh my God, I do not want to do business with you, right? So, so it's something, something's wrong, but that tells us that there's a skill missing. And so now, you know, now we can actually go and, and improve upon that. And so where this really comes in is this is, you're going to be busy going on these appointments, believe it or not, that's going to be your one goal. Because think about it, remember, it's two, two appointments technically to get a contract signed, but you may want to be going on a lot of appointments. When I first got into real estate, I went on three appointments a day. That was my goal. And I signed two contracts in two weeks. So you guys can all do that as well, but you're just going to, you need to get in front of people and talk about real estate somehow. Right. And it can be a bit done in a very normal fashion when you, when you've got the right scripts, everybody loves to talk about real estate. How's the market? What's going on? What are the interest rates? Blah, blah, blah. Right. So now we just need to know how to turn that into a possible opportunity. So, so back to where it comes in is the technology. You guys need the right tech beyond this point. This is where the tech comes in. Okay. If you don't have the right tech nowadays, and by the way, you don't have to be a tech genius. Okay. This stuff is very, um, like any, you know, okay. You go to the doctor's office, right? The admin there has your information in the system, that's what you're using. Similar type of uh, customer database management system, right? Facebook easy, yes, absolutely. And Keller Williams is partnered with Facebook, guys. We're partnered with Google and with Facebook because we have so, ma so many agents. So um, we actually get to run ads on Facebook for very little money that surpasses their algorithm basically goes around the algorithm of Facebook and, and it has a better uh, conversion ratio to get people to get, get you leads. So I'll give you an example. I ran an ad for $20. I got 27 leads, 27 real leads. This changes your conversation. So I'm not saying anything bad about any other company. You can, you can do these things if you're willing and able and, and a go-getter, you can go get business, right? But when you're constantly trying to go, oh, where can I find my next lead? That's a kind of a depressing conversation, right? <laughs> just like you guys just said, if you go through your contacts and now you're just like, where can I find more? What am I going to do, right? Versus you go with a company that will help you get the leads. And now you've got leads coming in. This is a different conversation. It's a much higher level conversation because now we're talking about how do we convert these? How, what skills do I need? What tools do I need? How do I be, how, how can I be the top person at this particular, whatever it is, right? Short sales or how, whatever you think you may want to focus on, All right? So there's so much more and I'm out of time, I know. <laughs> um, but I just want to bring up to you that um, when you're on your last uh, lesson here, Make sure that at that time you connect with either Ho or myself. I won't be on that particular call, but um, I want you guys to know that it's really important when you finish your, your certificates and we want to send in the um, application for your license. If you make any mistakes on that app, um, it takes freaking forever to get it perfect test date. So um, make sure we connect. What we can do is we can have you come into the office. We'll make sure the form is correct for you so that you can actually get that. Because even if you do it correctly, it's six weeks until they send you a, a link where you can schedule your own test date. So, um, okay, got it. So when you're on your last or whenever, even if you don't attend the last call, you know, uh, call me or call Ho and just let us know that you need some, you want to make sure that the application is checked off correctly. And so that way, because some of the things on there are just a little confusing. Okay. So um, uh, my phone number, sorry, you can't maybe see it on there. <clears throat> Gosh, my handwriting today. Okay. So you can call me here if you want, or text me, or anything else you guys think of. Let me know, and uh, I'm happy to help you guys. 
All right, so it's it's what I do on a daily. And and we also have a lot of tech and, and Zoom trainings and things like that already going that if you wanna check any of them out, just text me, I'll send you some links to some classes and you can join us and see what that looks like. I know I did that when I was going through school and it kept me motivated because this stuff is kind of boring sometimes. Let's be real here, <laughs> right? Meets and bounds. I always say this, I know, ho, but uh, I'm like, you know, how do I, um, <laughs> like how many acres is blah, blah, blah. I'm like, why do I need to know this Siri? How many acres are, <laughs> you know? So don't worry about it. Just get through this. You will get through it and um, just stay motivated, right? It's all in the mindset. So just remember that and then, and then we'll reconnect later. So Thanks. awesome. Thank you guys. You guys decide what you get out of this class. So make sure that it, the mind is right there too. All right. Thank you, Sonia. Thanks, Ho. We'll see Thank you guys later. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you guys. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so now Sonia is going to go enjoy the beach. <laughs> Hopefully. I don't even know if the beaches are open. Um, any yeah. questions or comments about what Sonia had to say? Yeah, I have a question. Yes. Um, when she was saying 23,005, is that a yearly uh, commission that the agency gets or is that just a one time? It's a one year, uh, it resets every year. Every year resets. Uh -huh. And so in my first year, I didn't cap. I was not able to sell enough to complete that cap. A reset, I, I reset in Ju uh, July, end of June. And so the following, anniversary year, I cap in about 11 months. It took me 11 months. It was pathetic. <laughs> and then I, I said, okay, man, this is great. I cap. So now I get a hundred percent commission. I closed one more deal and I got a hundred percent commission and it felt great. After that, it resets again. <clears throat> the following anniversary year, I capped in two months. That's good. So I had 10 months of 100% commission. And then the year after that, I capped in three months. And then the year after that, I capped in one week. That's good. So you start getting in a momentum. And then I got comfy and I got lazy and I, I capped in like six months. <laughs> uh, that's the danger. Uh, we talk about big numbers here, uh, you know quarter million a year, a hundred thousand a year or whatever. In a good month, any one of you could have a hundred thousand dollar month. I know cause I've had it and I know a lot of people have. The challenge is how consistent are you and how repeatable are you with that grind? Like, no, 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 let's not call it grind. Grind sounds so forced. Um, how well do you attract, you know, that kind of business? How passionate you are, actually. Yeah, I think people feel. Um, any other questions? No, thank you. Nope. Um, Sonia says something like, <clears throat> oftentimes the new, new uh, or, or, or whenever you start a new career, there's a learning curve. And you go through, you're going to hit a wall oftentimes and, hey, maybe this is not for me. You know, what she was saying, maybe this is not for me. If you find yourself thinking that, I'm going to say this in a little blunt way so that hopefully it's a wake up call and maybe not kick in the butt. Maybe this isn't for me. Well, maybe nothing really is for you if you give up that easily. Um, Oftentimes, I, I raised two daughters, and um, they were one was in a, a orchestra. She was a violinist, and the other one is a, a swimmer, a competitive swimmer. And I watched many years their friends and uh, my kids going through the difficulties. <clears throat> my daughter is hitting the flip turn. You swim one length of the pool, you flip turn. Swim back, flip turn, swim back. The flip turn technique is, is really important. 
And so when these kids came to a stage of their uh, swimming uh, competitive career, the coach started introducing new forms of flip turns, which this is what you have to do to get better. It was really hard. And a lot of kids, you know what they said, mom, I don't think swimming is really, eh, I don't know. It's not, it's, yeah, I'm not dropping time. Can what, can I try a uh, cross country running? <laughs> you know what I mean, right? I, yeah. And then they go cross country and in the beginning, everything is easy because you're talented or whatever. And then suddenly you have to now put a little effort to go to the next level. And that's when they, and eh, maybe cross country is not for me. Um, maybe I'll go water polo because I know how to swim. So I see a lot of us in our adult life switching from career to career to career, thinking we're going to land on something because I don't know, one of those motivational speakers always talk about love what you do or do what you love or, and you, don't have, you won't have to work a day in your life. I think we misunderstood that in a big way. You have to learn how to love what you do. You do what you got to do, but learn how to love it, right? So maybe this isn't for me. Be very careful when that, be very aware. If that thought crosses your mind, you have to take a look back and say, no, maybe I'm about to hit the next level of this career. Keep going. Okay. So that's the breakthrough that, we have to, uh, and one of the breakthroughs a lot of people could achieve if we gave into the idea of studying and memorizing scripts. Uh, everything is scripted. I don't know if you noticed that. <laughs> In our daily lives, if I see Elizabeth, hi Elizabeth, good morning, how are you? You know that good morning, how are you greeting is a part of the daily script we use, okay? Did you clean up your room? The parents have that script. It's all script. <clears throat> so uh, be comfortable with the idea of having to use a script. All right. So let's see. I have this slide. You all see the slide? Yeah. Okay. Set my monitor. So I can see the chat box and everything. Okay. <clears throat> so this month of uh, July, we're going to have three sessions covering finance. Um, we're going to cover finance, principle, and practice of real estate. So these are the three topics we cover. Each topic will result in a certificate. Three certificates later, you guys apply to the California state exam and the license. Fingerprint, all of that stuff. And then you're, you take the license, uh, test, pass the test and you get your license and you uh, start selling real estate. It's that easy. So basically we have one module a month, uh, this month's module is finance, uh, six lectures per month. So we go through two lectures per week and two lectures, each lecture usually has two or three slides, uh, presentations. So this is one of the slides, um, three months total. <clears throat> um, the three topics we're gonna cover, practice principles and finance. Um, and we also talk about, of course, we have like the, uh, the theoretical part, uh, the concepts, the terms, uh, the contracts and disclosures, um, and what our in-class or the Zoom sessions will provide to you <clears throat> is the typical everyday agent activity, which is what I do. And I oftentimes offer to whoever is interested if you have the time, you're more than welcome to come to my office and shadow me. See what I do all day, which is a whole lot of nothing. But 
you get a feel for what it's like to be in this business. Uh, it will be unfiltered. So it might be a, a comic, <laughs> bring your camera. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and then my share, I share my experience and, and uh, my tips for as a realtor, as a professional that sells real estate actively. <clears throat> um, we, we deal with buyers, sellers, real estate agents, fellow agents. Uh, we deal with the supporting industry, the escrow companies, uh, the lenders, and the biggest activity that we are responsible for is prospecting is looking for that next business. So oftentimes we pop a bottle of champagne every time we close an escrow and the celebration is short lived because somebody in the group always have to ask who's next or where's the next deal. <laughs> and oftentimes all we're doing is like, hey, celebrate, we closed deal. Uh, we got, just got paid a big fat check and somebody has to ruin the party. It's like, where's the next check? <laughs> So prospecting is something that we have to keep in the pipeline. Um, we have easy clients, difficult clients. We have drama clients. Uh, we have crazy clients. We have bipolar people that we have to deal with. Uh, we have clients that are not really motivated or sometimes they are just wasting your time. If your prospecting hasn't been good, you don't have a pipeline of potential customers. And when that happens, you have to tolerate the crappy, low quality clientele. If you have a good pipeline, you can fire these clients that are just giving you a headache and wasting your time. If you prospect daily, prospect regularly, you can have an easier life. Um, so first topic, that we'll talk about here is nature and cycle of the real estate finance. Nature and cycle. I think in everything there's a cycle. Uh, typically it's 10 years, stock market, uh, the economy, uh, the real estate. Um, it, it's just, it, and this time the coronavirus kind of caused all of this. Uh, so we have general financing terms, uh, currency, interest and we have what's called the primary mortgage market the market in which lenders directly lend to borrowers that's the primary mortgage interest is uh, what you pay for your borrowed money the currency is the unit of monetary exchange uh, debt secured debt equity Equity in real estate is the it is different be, difference between what a property is worth and what the owner owes against the property. You know, as we talk about this, we I'm going to introduce new ways of looking at things that may differ from what is commonly known as all oh, investment. The term investment is so uh, loosely used. Um, you know, people say I'm investing in myself kind of a thing. And then it's like, oh yeah, uh, I'm buying this car and I think it's going to hold its value. It's a good investment. Um, you know, we use in, in the word investment in these terms. Um, as real estate professionals, I suggest we are very, we become careful in how we use the word investment. The reason I say this, I have a lot of wealthy, um, really smart clients and for them they are watching every word they're listening to every word i say every like the vocabulary and one of them is a good friend of mine and he started pointing out to me and you know how if you don't want to sound dumb you got to stop saying things like this and things like that uh, because the really smart people they'll choose who to work with based on how ver well versed you are in these, you know. 
So for big real estate investors, this, the word investment, there's got to be a return on investment attached to that investment. There's going to be a cash flow. If there's no cash flow for a lot of these people, it's, they don't call it an investment. It's costing you money. You know, your primary residence is not an investment. It's costing you money. It's not making you money. Now, you make, make you money when you sell. That's a different story. So the buyer's purchasing team, when you're working with buyers, we have a team that we work with. Uh, we have the lender. Um, if your buyer has a lot of cash and they're buying it cash outright, no loans, uh, of course, no lender is needed. When a lender is <clears throat> in the picture, you have the underwriter, the appraiser. Uh, appraiser these days, the appraisal report these days is has become an issue. Um, actually, after coronavirus, it's a mix uh, because of the, there are some homeowners that don't like strangers coming into their house unnecessarily. A lot of the appraisers are doing drive-by appraisal. Uh, I have an escrow right now in Mar Vista. The house is vacant and the buyer's agent the, told me the appraiser is gonna call you. I said, okay, well, a week goes by, a week and a half goes by, nobody calls me. So I called the agents, hey, How's the appraisal? Was it ordered? Oh yeah, it's done. <laughs> I guess they just drove by and you know, it's all good. Um, escrow documents. <clears throat> and as uh, I don't know if you all know, but escrow is a company, it's a third party company uh, the buyers and sellers will use to conduct the transaction. The sellers are to disclose everything they know about the property. Um, if there was a water stain in the ceiling, what is that related to? Yes, there was a water leak in the, uh, the roof uh, two years ago. We patched and it's fixed. Here's the invoice and this is the company that performed the job. Now it's dry, but it's stained. So if you don't like it, you can paint it. That's the kind of disclosure we're talking about. Also, like, if you know your neighbor is, you're moving because your neighbor is a psycho, you might want to disclose that too. Um, I just tell my clients, disclose everything. Hey, so this, could this be a, a potential issue? Should I disclose this? Yes. If you have to ask me, yes. Uh, death on the property is another big issue for a lot of people. Has there been death on the property? Um, and then you know, we have the service providers, escrow company, title, NHD, home warranty insurance, uh, home insurance, uh, HOA, if it's a condominium. So all of these people are involved. And our job is as a realtor, we should, this triangle should put us right in the middle. And our job is to keep everything cool. Um, because you know why? This is the problem. In the big picture of things, look at it this way. You have the buyer and the seller. The buyer wants to pay the least amount of money. Seller wants the most amount of money. By definition, buyers and sellers will never be on the same page. Our job as realtors is to buffer that difference. Keep them cool. Because uh, at times they will be a very personal, they take things personally. Um, our job is to keep everything calm and collected, okay? Lenders are late on underwriting. People complain. And our job is to just magically <laughs> keep everything calm, magically. Um, financing. Okay, so ownership is a fundamental component in real estate. Uh, it's considered basic right for every citizen. Uh, each property owner obtains certain rights along property ownership. There are benefits of ownership. It's the financial advantage. Home equity in a thriving market, profit when sold, bundle of rights. You know, uh, the, the silliest, fullest thing people could do 
um, hey, why aren't you buying a house now? It's like, oh, the prices are high. I'm waiting for it to drop. They wait a year, two, five years later. Hey, so when are you going to buy? Oh, when the prices drop some more. <laughs> and we could continue this conversation for 30 years. So the foolish thing to do is to wait, not wait to buy, hoping the prices drop. And yes, because we have a cycle, the price might drop uh, momentarily, but it's gonna quickly pick up again. Thriving market or not, home equity is real. The people that have been renting forever, hoping for some sort of a market crash, the balloon bur bubble bursting, and so they could get a great deal. Uh, these people are just waiting, still waiting and waiting and waiting. Uh, that is the fullest thing you can do. Actually, let me find the, uh, I'll show you later the photo. Um, So you have also the bundle of rights. So this is the, so you, you get to enjoy the land, the real estate, the property. It's, uh, and I think for a lot of people, especially if you are coming from a rental uh, group, whenever you get that 30 day notice or 60 day notice from a landlord saying, hey, I am selling my house, so you gotta move out. Uh, I think that's the, the last thing you want to hear as a tenant and that sense of like insecurity um, is the pain. So later when you're dealing with buyers and they're renting and they're taking the sweet ass time, this is the kind of conversation because we have to understand their pain and the pleasure. The pain for everyone renting anything is that unknown of when the landlord is going to send them a notice. That is the pain. Keep, keep probing that pain button. That, that's what I do. Um, bundle rights owners, okay, use, possess, transfer, encumber, and enjoy. Oh, by the way, in real estate, you're going to see a lot of acronyms. UPTEE, um, NAR, CAR, MLS, uh, get used to it. Possess, transfer, encumber, encumber. Encumber is a big one. Uh, let's say you bought this house a long time ago and it's paid off. Um, you don't want to sell the house, but you need some cash out. Uh, you can encumber. Put the property as security to borrow money. Uh, use is, of course, using is possess, to have and to hold, transfer. You could give it to your kids or to me. Uh, real property versus personal property. Uh, real property is all that is immovable. So land, trees, buildings, fences, all other things permanently attached on the land. Now, you know, um, Anything that is not real property, cars, electronics, furniture, hanging wall, lawnmower, not permanently attached, fine. So obviously these are things that it, it's pretty clear. They're, they don't come with the house when you're buying. But then, well, I guess we'll talk about it some other time. How about a, a light fixture? How about a fridge? Some kitchens have the fridge built in, custom. So that looks attached, pretty well attached. Some fridges are just, you know, just slid in there. It's not really attached. Um, so for these borderline items, uh, I always suggest in the purchase contract, this is a purchase contract, buyer offers this much money to buy this property, included items, excluded items. There are lines like that in the contract. Always spell it out, included. Refrigerator in the garage. I want that to stay. Or if it's too old and too crappy and smelly, I don't want it. So you actually sell it to remove 
fridge from the garage prior to close of escrow. These are the things that it's our job to find out what our clients want and we spell it out. Our job is not really just to find a house and get them the house. Our also, the bigger job is the fiduciary duty, which is representation of our client, representing to their best interest, not my interest, their best interest. Once they feel that you've done it, oh man, they're gonna love it forever. Okay, types of real property. So you have land, water rights, minerals, airspace. This is what we primarily will deal with. Um, I don't think we'll deal most uh, people with, hey, I want to buy the water rights for this you know, plot of land or airspace. Uh, we typically deal with the house that is sitting on the land. So we'll deal with the land. But just so you know, these are all the different types of real property. Um, up to a reasonable height, for example, sky rise condominium, also known as vertical airspace is sold as real property by owner or developer. Um, encloses land, includes the soil, the rocks stretch that stretch to the center of the earth. Wow. All the way down there. Um, water rights. I know. One of my clients has a 12 unit apartment in Wilmington. She owns the land and she owns the, the building and the apartments. She has tenants in there, but then some other person owns the water rights. So you could have different ownerships. <clears throat> Minerals, real property, unless someone removes them from the ground, that's becoming personal property. Uh, reminder, land, anything permanent, permanent, commercial fixtures, although attached, they are commercial fixtures, trade fixtures. They're not real property. Dental chairs, counters, heating units. Again, these are all negotiable items that should be included in the contract. So we're just talking about definition here. Uh, fixtures, an attached fixture is real property that used to be personal property. Attached fixture. Every time I read this, I wonder how was it attached? Was it glued? Was it bolted down? Is it uh, on foundation, right? Um, it, it's a, I think it's a difference. Oh, maybe this is it. thinking about writing an offer on this house. Yes, but I don't know what I'm writing an offer on. Like, is it the house or the house and all the stuff in it? What stays and what does the seller take with them? Everything stays except for personal property. Okay, but how do I know what personal property is? Personal property is anything that can be picked up and carried away without unscrewing it or detaching it from the house. So flowers planted in the ground come with the house, but flowers in a pot our personal property because the pot can be carried away without <laughs> another example of personal property would be a dog house but if it's screwed into the deck or attached to the house it's supposed to stay with the house if i like any of the seller's personal property can i ask for it yep you can write in items on your offer and then you and the seller can negotiate them just like any other terms in the offer what kinds of personal property do people generally ask for Buyers sometimes ask for the fridge, the washer and dryer, a lawnmower, even furniture. What if I really, really like the seller's dog? All right, we're not saying it's a great idea, but it's not unheard of for the seller to leave a pet. We would suggest drawing the line at asking for the seller's child, unless they have a teenager and then they're probably negotiable. These are just some uh, examples. You know, this baseball uh, backboard basket. 
Yeah. So, yeah, never assume. Maybe the seller was planning to take the tree and then you, let's say there's an avocado tree in the backyard. Um, that was one of the selling points. But for the seller, it's like, no, I'm taking this tree with me. <laughs> I don't know if that's even doable, but let's say that happened. Um, it's like, hey, where's my tree? <laughs> You just close escrow, you're ready to move in, and the tree's gone. That would suck. Um, <clears throat> light fixture is a typical, it's so typical that uh, it's a commonly talked about item throughout the purchase. Um, one of the houses that I had, and when I sold it, the buyer wanted, the buyer was very specific. If the chandelier doesn't stay, I don't want the house. Um, it was a Swarovski chandelier. It was a, it was a big expensive chandelier, but the house was a lot bigger and more expensive. So we just <laughs> decided to leave it there. Um, we had a playground in the backyard. He didn't want it. He wanted me to move it prior to close of escrow. So negotiables. Oh, how about blinds? You would imagine, oh, ah, this is a custom fit blind. Uh, of course it stays. Well, you never know. The seller, there are crazy people out there. The seller may think, no, I'm going to reinstall these in my new house. They might take it. How do you know? So write it in the contract. So here's the difference between a good agent and a horrible agent. The good agent is always watching out for every detail, predicting everything. The horrible agent is the one reacting to after it's, it's too late. So now you're putting out fires. Um, <clears throat> there's two types of real estate. Freehold estate, which is the simple fee, and then less than freehold estate. It's a leasehold. Uh, an example of this leasehold estate is like the mobile home. Uh, you buy the mobile home, the house, but you're paying a monthly lease. You don't own the land to which the mobile home is bolted to. Uh, most homes we sell are going to be the freehold estates. Um, you just own the house, free, like the land, until you sell it. This type of home is commonly transferred in a real estate transaction, and you will typically see in your state real estate career. An owner can dispose of the property during this lifetime or after death by will, a state of inheritance. Title company. Title companies, uh, do any of you have any friends or relatives that are in the title uh, insurance business? Uh, if you don't, as soon as you get your license, you'll be bombarded by title reps, lenders, loan officers, escrow officers, all these other supporting industry representatives. Uh, things have changed, so they won't whine and dine you, whereas many years ago they used to, uh, but they'll still be super nice and they will provide a lot of help. So. Uh, be open to meeting new people. By the way, <clears throat> Sonia was talking about contacts. Contacts, uh, how many contacts you need for this, how many contacts you need for that. Uh, in this industry, be open to meeting new people. And the mindset that I've adopted, everyone I meet, and, it, and I meet for coffee, for dinner, I meet new friends uh, along the golf course, uh, wine bars, wherever I go. Uh, but I'm always purposeful about keeping them as a connection for future. So this is what I was taught some time ago. You know how any and everyone you meet has a purpose in your life. Potential client, possible business partner, could be an employee, could be a good friend, a lifelong friend. It could be, gosh, you know what I mean? So everyone you meet 
has a purpose in your life. And you have to nurture their relationship to find out what that purpose is. So don't discount anyone. Uh, keep them in your database. So same thing with these title reps, lenders, um, from all these different companies, they will approach you. They might become a good source of uh, referral. Um, I have one that is really, we became really good friends. And anytime he knows a friend or a relative that wants to do anything in real estate, I'm the one that he calls. So it's a referral partner. <clears throat> uh, and then this is uh, the leasehold. Real estate financing relation of collateral hypothecation leverage. So collateral, pledging real estate as a promise to repay a loan. It's a secure, so if you don't pay your, your bills, they'll take the house from you. Like the car is another example of collateral. Uh, credit cards are unsecured debts. The, the credit card company has nothing to come after. All they can do is sue you. Um, the car loan, they can take your car. The banks, where you have your mortgage with, will take your house by the foreclosure process. Hypothecation. Um, the borrower remains in control and retains the rights of possession of the house even though the house is not paid yet, paid off. Car, same thing. I remember, I don't know if you guys ever done a layaway plan. There will be stores and I say, okay, I wanna buy this uh, bicycle as a kid. How much is the bicycle? $100, okay. Here's $10, can you hold this bike for me? Another week, $10, another week, $5 and you, Pay little at a time as you can, but the bike is not in my possession. So hypothecation is a process, I, I guess the word to describe how it's not paid off. You just borrowed money to buy it. You keep it, but now the house is not really all yours. On paper, uh, the lien holder is the bank, but I get to live in the house. Uh, leverage, okay, this is a word, another word, overused. Um, so using a smaller amount of borrower's money to secure a big loan to purchase the property. Borrowers invest a fraction of a loan amount, down payment, and leverage by borrowing the balance of the loan amount. So leverage, here it's being used as debt. How much money do you owe? Um, you hear terms like, oh, this investment company is over leveraged, over leveraged. Um, it's a lot of payment to have. Okay, cycles, short term cycles, long term, three to five years, seven to 10. Historically, uh, we have the annual cycle holiday season, you have the vacation, summer vacation season, right? Um, and then the long terms are the ones where you go through buyer's market and the seller's market. So class outlook, Blake's based on all factors, when do you think the current real estate cycle will reach its peak? Oh man, this is the most asked question and I think is the, the worst question to ask. <laughs> I don't have a crystal ball. Uh, we hit the peak just prior to coronavirus and coronavirus affected quite a bit. Uh, yes, there are pockets of different parts of town that things are still on fire and things are selling like crazy. Uh, but mm, as a general, no. Uh, my listing inventory didn't sell. I thought it, I thought it would be gone in about two weeks. Uh, it's been like two months now. <laughs> I don't have any offers. I lowered the price already. Um, as a matter of fact, my client can't afford to stay 
she lives in a different property. So she has two properties. One she lives in, and this was a rental. And the rental, the tenant moved out. So she wanted to sell, take the money, and send it to Houston and buy some property for her daughter. It's not selling. She can't maintain both mortgages without the help of a tenant paying for one of the units. Uh, so she, she's like, okay, this is too long. This is not happening. Put a tenant in there. So now we have a tenant moving in August. Now, this tenant stays for a year or two. After a year or two, the market will pick up. At that time, I think the client will want to sell. So my job is to stay in touch with this client looking forward to that day, right? It's a long-term uh, business. Uh, recovery, expansion, recession. Yeah, I mean, in theory, in economical and real estate theory, this cycle is exists, but real estate is so local. Um, let me see if there's another... So the national real estate market here, for example, let's look at this graph, 1965 up to 2015. So this is uh, 50, 60, 50 year, you know. You look at the, this is a price, the medium sale price of a house sold in the United States. It goes up, 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 okay. It dropped here, it dropped here a little bit, dro dropped here, it dropped here. There was another drop here, another drop, another drop, another drop. Oh, big drop here. 07, 08, this is the big drop. Uh, but look at the rest of it. <laughs> so you see, have we reached the peak? Uh, I guess right here, let's say, I guess right here and then my answer could have been like, no, we're not at the peak yet because I'm, I'm waiting for this one. But you're asking me about at this time. So we can analyze data and argue about this to a blue in the face. Reality is, I like looking at this big graph. So if you did, if you think people look at this and say, man, I should have bought this 30 years ago. Uh, you heard that before, right? When is, the when is the best time to plant a tree? 30 years ago. Well, when is the next best time to plant a tree? Right now. If you don't listen to me, that's fine. We could have a, this same conversation in 30 years. Does, does that make sense? So this is the kind of stuff that we have to keep in mind. So when we are talking to uh, the consumers, I mean, we want to make a sale, but in reality, by providing this vision, we are doing the consumer a favor. There are some Central Valley, Southern California, San Francisco Bay Area, price increase, decrease. You see, all the numbers are different. It's very local. Real estate is very local. Some areas are affected more, some areas affected less. Um, Here's another script that I use. Uh, well, I'm waiting for the prices to drop uh, if this happens or the elections or whatever. And you wanna buy where? In Redonda Beach? Okay, great. Uh, I don't think prices will drop much around Redonda Beach. If you go out to, what's the county here? Let's go down. Let's pick one that has a horrible number. What's the lowest? San Bernardino County. Okay, San Bernardino County. If you want to buy a house in San Bernardino County, sure, wait for that disaster to happen. The price will drop. I know, because nobody wants to be there. Um, when you take the five, the 15 freeway to drive to Vegas, I think it's the 10, the 15, as you drive north, there's a ton of new houses being built. 
brand new houses with big pools and AC and everything. But it's way out there. I don't know about you, but I don't want to live out there. And of course, the house prices are three hundred thousand, four hundred thousand for a gigantic house. Um, for four hundred thousand dollars, you get a one-bedroom condo here in Redondo Beach. <laughs> so you see, it's it's this desirability. Um, So cycle, that's. Okay, so the brain game. At the end of each slide, we go through these questions. Um, here, you have your opportunity to unmute yourself and answer this and participate. Uh, the charge for the use of money, people pay. People pay this to borrow money. Interest. interest, yes. We're playing Jeopardy here. Oh, I'm sorry. What is interest? <laughs> <clears throat> Type of estate for an indefinite time frame and belongs to a homeowner. Something that's free. <laughs> Freehold estate. A buyer borrower remains in control and retains the rights of possession to the house. What is a leaseholder? Oh, this is that ugly word. Hypothecation. Is that a my house or yours? Let, let the ambulance pass by here. <laughs> I'm in the Revere office. I'm right on Catalina and Avenue I. There's a lot of people out there now. Okay, what was that? Uh, enacting laws that benefit. Enacting laws that benefit public health, safety, and general welfare. Mm, I think that's, where is that coming from? Police power. We didn't talk about police power. Okay, slide will do that every now and then. Land, airspace, minerals, and water rights. Types of property? Real property. Real property. No examples of real property. Although attached, not considered real property. Not real property. Personal. Oh no, commercial and trade fixtures. Okay. When you take your state exam, constantly we're thinking about what do I have to know this for the state exam? Do I have to know this for the state exam? Uh, that's a tough one. State exam is going to be a standardized tests. I think there were eight or nine different versions of tests that are given at the same time. It's just like when you go to DMV to take a driver's exam. Uh, and let's say I'm, I'm taking the exam. There's another person next to me. They have version A, I have version B. Okay. But it's basically the same kinds of question. Um, my suggestion in how to study for the state exam is go through the sample, the practice tests. Um, memorize the answers. <laughs> Most of them will be kind of straightforward, common sense type thing. Uh, at least for me, the ones that I had difficulty with is what year did the feds blah, blah. It's like, I don't know, was that a 1965, 1860, I don't know the dates. See, it's a fact. These facts, you just have to memorize, okay? If you ask me, what were you, what, um, there are things that make sense and you can understand. It's easier to just remember. But there are facts that like things like year or how many, how many square feet in an acre. It's a number they just have to memorize. So just like that, look at the standardized test as one more thing you have to memorize. And I guarantee you, when you're going through the test in the test date, the real test, 
as you read through the tests, answer the ones you know for sure first. Any doubt that you have, skip. And as you are reading and answering the ones you know, once you go through the entire exam, you're going to remember a lot of this is going to come back to memory. And then you can go back a second time. And now the ones that you had doubt, you have certainty based on the entire exam that you read. You do this about three passes or four, uh, you'll be good. I did like, I don't know, three times over the entire exam. I still had like 10 questions that I had no idea what they're asking. I, it was a blind guess, um, but I passed anyways. Okay, there we go. Next slide. Any questions so far? Yeah, I do. I can't. No? No good? All right. For those that are here for the first time, do you think this is something you think you will be interested in pursuing as a career? Yes. 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 It goes yes. along with yes. what yep. I've been doing. I have a question actually. Mm -hmm. um, I know my son's taking the CPA test right now and I know that when they do a test, you can't go back on the real estate test. Can you go back like you said to the questions? Cause I know on the CPA test, you can't go back on the questions. Really, you can't, that's sucks. Yeah, I know my son was telling me. Yeah, I, in real estate exam, the whole computer, it's a software you scroll through the hundreds of questions, 150 questions. You scroll through them okay. um, and you can scroll back up. At least that's how it was for me. I took my exam seven years ago, so I don't know if things have changed. Okay. I don't think it has. Um, <laughs> even if it has, you'll be fine. Um, you know, I, I see so many new people getting licenses, so many people excited to get into real estate business very often. And a good number of them just disappear within months. And so I'm used to that. However, I don't know who will make it and who won't. I don't have that crystal ball. I, I want to believe every name on my screen here like what the, the 13 of us here or the 12 of us, I want to believe every one of you have the capability of become tomorrow's mega agent. And my job is to believe in one, every one of you that you can, even though you might not believe in yourself. See, that's not something I can control, but I can control it. Me and my company, my brokerage, we, always want to believe that you are the next megastar. And I actually have this in my, like, let's say Darlene, Elizabeth, Jody, Luis, you know, all of you guys. One of these days, you're going to be standing on this major national event where you are on stage receiving an award for something great that you have achieved in real estate, either sales, uh, money making, I don't know. You're up there receiving an award. And my name is Ho, Ho Chung, my name is Ho. So you're going to say, uh, I'm honored to be here receiving this award. Um, I'd like to thank blah, 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 blah. But especially, I want to thank Ho Chung. They believed in me <laughs> when I first started. Really. So keep that in mind. And you could buy me some pairs of shoes too. <laughs> so money. What is money? 
Money is what makes the go world the world go around. Money is good. Money doesn't grow on trees, but it kind of does. Money is the root of all evil. No, it's not. Money can't buy happiness. Oh yes, yes it, can. it can. Yes, it can. Um, money is only good for what you do with it, right? But for terminology, money is the exchange currency that you know you use for. You get paid for services. You use that money to buy things you want. Uh, so you have personal income and you have depo disposable personal income. Um, by the way, I I like my clientele to be uh, ones with a lot of a lot of disposable income. Yeah, great. <clears throat> okay. Um, one of my clients bought a, a yacht, a sailboat. <laughs> so I was like, I don't have a sailboat, but I know somebody that does. Um, I don't have a private jet, but I know somebody that does. And I get invited. Um, so that's what matters. So per disposable income is oftentimes what makes your real estate career a little easier uh, when you're dealing with clients that have that kind of disposable income. Um, trainers Aldo, how has my life changed due to financial benefits from real estate career? Um, it's a term of mindset. If I am open to the idea of making a ton of money, I will. And once I make the money, I start getting comfy and I let off the gas and I stop the activities that generated that income. I'll quickly go back to my old self. Um, one thing I realized, <clears throat> I don't know what kind of job you guys have now, but typically you have a salary that you get paid every month. You have a yearly salary, you have a fixed income and it's predictable. And we all want predictability and we don't like surprises. So oftentimes you see most of the country working a job, a nine to five job, it's consistency but it's limited it's fixed income when you're in the sales business like real estate you get paid on commission you don't get paid by the hour oh by the way um i i suggest we don't talk about my hourly rate you know oftentimes like oh yeah my hourly rate is this my hourly rate of that um Real wealthy people talk about getting paid for the results that they produce, not by the hours. So I've had months selling real estate that were life-changing. It was like, <laughs> that's what I mean by, you're not in a fixed income uh, job. I, I was just working my ass off and I one thing led to another and one month, I was like one hundred thirty thousand dollars. Wow! Uh, five escrows, and previously, I didn't make that kind of money in my other a year. Okay, um, many years ago, I had a family business where we had we owned the business, and as a company, we made a lot of money. But this was a game changer where I realized. You're no longer on fixed income. You're getting paid for the results that you produce. Um, you, you start becoming a little more purposeful uh, about what you do every day. What am I doing right now that is going to produce anything? If the answer is, depending on that answer, you should quickly stop doing it or doing it, do it harder. Um, so I, I don't have TV at home. I don't, I don't watch Game of Thrones or anything like that because it's not adding to any productivity. Um, okay, the national economy, capitalism, the economic system in America is a mixed capitalist, okay? Capitalist economy system in which privately owned and managed. California is the fifth largest economy in the world. Fifth, second, seventh, who cares? The restaurants are still closed. 
Uh, real estate plays a major role in the economy. So real estate is huge in, I want to say out of my wealthy clients, I have one that is primarily stock market and they own a few real estate properties, but most of my wealthy clients, most of their assets is in real estate. They have, they own hundreds of doors and they call it doors. It's not houses or it's not units. They call it doors. Oh yeah. Oh, uh, this year I want to buy another five doors. Okay. <laughs> and then, you know, this is how they talk. So the housing need is there. It's never going to end. Um, you know, they stopped making land a long time ago, but human beings are continuously making babies. So the need for a roof over your head is never going to stop. Unless being homeless in Venice is the new norm. Then, then what, we might have a recession or, or a crash, major crash. So real estate hires many uh, produces many jobs contractors painters home inspectors uh, cleaning crew uh, lawn landscapers surveyors pool people you name it it's just it makes the go the money go around um, small business association let's see california is home to more than 3.9 million businesses oh it's home to all these Restaurant chains. Uh, restaurant chains. Okay. okay. Why do we have echo? Why do we have echo? Are you guys having echo? No. Okay. No. Um, McDonald's is an interesting company. Yeah. Isn't McDonald's a real estate company? Really? I think there was a documentary or movie based on the real story where McDonald's is not a restaurant or food uh, company. They, that's just an excuse to get the franchisees to rent the land that McDonald's owns. Okay. So it's a way of guaranteeing. Uh, and look, look at what they're, where they are now. They're everywhere. If there's a McDonald's in a complex, there's, it's their anchor tenant. Uh, Starbucks is an anchor tenant. McDonald's, 7-Eleven, these are all anchor tenants where, and I think they play a major role in real estate. Um, gosh, even King Taco. King Taco has 21 locations. They own every single one of them. Uh, real estate is where the longevity lies. And by the way, I don't know what your motive is to get into real estate, but I suggest one of them become so that you become a landlord and a real estate investor. Uh, California housing market. What shapes the housing market? Shortage. A lot of people want to move to California. Great weather. Weather. Mm, California is just sexier. Oh, you pay for it. Yeah, who wants to be in Iowa or like Omaha or uh, I don't even know where these other places are. Just everyone wants to be in California. And so when there's so many people wanting to move and live here, the demand is going to be high. And when the demand is high, the prices are high. It's just that simple. Uh, parts of Detroit, I think... Um, the city is giving away homes for free. Uh, and, and the only requirement is that you maintain it clean and beautify the city. <laughs> Who the hell is going to do that in California anywhere here? <laughs> um, housing affordability index. Uh, it's just another gauge to see how many people on average can or is able to afford a a medium priced home in that area. Mortgage rates, mortgage interest rates. Interest rates determine the amount of a loan borrower can get. High rates, low, low amounts. Yep. 
affordability index different in many different counties or what is this by county california we are where are we los angeles county right here so i guess it's like here, the extreme is 17% of people could afford the medium price home. 31% uh, and the, the other one. And then a lot of people here could afford homes. So you see, my God, the price. Okay, how do I assist buyers who are searching for an inexpensive home, a great deal, in a high-priced location? How do I assist buyers who are on drugs? Uh, I, I just have to give them a dose of reality. Um, hey, I want a house in Redondo Beach. Uh, I want like three bedrooms, three bathrooms, and I don't want to pay more than five hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> you know that doesn't exist. So you know it go, works out two ways. One is like I show them things in their price range. They get disgusted. I show them what they want, and it's like double the price, or significantly more expensive. So they get disgusted again. Now. It's just of a dose of reality. I, I, it's our job to show to our clients what reality is. Now, some of them will say, well, I do have the money, but I just refuse to pay because I think the prices are inflated. Um, well, then when, do, when is the price dropping next? Um, my usual, this is my scripted answer. Prices typically drop when the interest rates go higher. Right now, the prices are a little higher because the interest rates are so low. So you could borrow money for less. So your mortgage payment doesn't really change. So yeah, next time the price drops is probably when we see a rise in interest rates. Uh, are you buying cash? Because if you are, it's okay to wait. If you're gonna have to borrow money, it will make a difference if you buy today or later. That's my script, you know, to get people off the fence. At the end of the day, if you want to buy a house, you buy a house. If you don't, you're just wasting my time. Let's see. Oh, the Fed, Federal Reserve System and the U.S. Treasury. Uh, okay, the Fed was established in 1913 by Congress. See, 1913, you have to memorize that. Um, it provides a nation with the stable monetary and financial system. This is nation's center bank, also known as the banker's bank. Uh, their responsibility is to implement nation's monetary policies, supervise, regulate banking, uh, protect the consumer, maintain a uh, stability of financial system, of horsepower. Uh, the feds are the ones that kind of put a lid on the interest rates. Uh, they, they kind of buffer a lot of the disaster that potentially could happen. Um, I grew up in a different country, in a country where the currency becomes so weak because they don't have, you know, the Federal Reserve System like we do. The U.S. Treasury also involved in helping maintain economic balance, financial manager, US Treasury system responsibilities. They control daily operation, huge federal debt. We still have a federal debt, trillion. Trillion, bazillion. How many is a Brazilian? <laughs> I grew up in Brazil. That's why it's so funny to me because there was a time one Cruzeiro 
was worth something. And then when I moved out of Brazil in 86, they cut three zeros from the currency and they relabeled the currency. A couple of months later, they cut three more zeros because to buy a, a little hamburger, you have to carry so much money. You know, they you just, because we have the treasury and all these things we have in place, we have stability, somewhat of a stable economic system here. Other countries are just. Um, mortgage lending laws. Okay, there's a lot of laws that every time financing money is involved, and this is the money related to consumer and the, the borrower and the lending. Anything that has to do with money will have to abide by these lending laws. Um, I've seen loan officers lose their license and go to jail. I've seen real estate licensees getting their licenses suspended. Uh, this is nothing to take lightly. Um, Truth and Lending Act, 1968. Federal law requiring disclosures about its terms and cost to standardized manner. APR. <clears throat> you know, when you, you have this advertisement that you see and then you go and buy something. And then at the end of the, the transaction, you end up paying and then you pay more than what you first saw in the advertisement. The lending, there was a lot of that going on in the lending. The consumers were not, were being like uh, taken advantage of. So that's the term fine print. Uh, the fine print is, there. everything here to do with consumer protection is eliminating fine print as much as possible so that there's no surprise for the borrower. Uh, like, hey, I thought it was 4%. Why is this now 4.125? It's like, well, the 0.125 is because you, da 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 da, -da is something else. Like, oh, it makes sense. But I wish I had a, I had known that. <laughs> that's, that's what happens. Um, RESPA, Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act, 1974, RESPA, requires lenders to give borrowers advanced disclosure of loan charges and costs. So points, fees, all of that stuff has to be disclosed ahead of time. In a real estate sale, when I get a call from a seller or it's a prospect or somebody that was a referral, um, hey, ho, I'm thinking of selling my house. Uh, can we talk? So I go for the appointment, meet them at their house, take a look at their house, and we talk about the process, why they want to move and all that stuff. And I, I always like asking, have you sold a house before? Oh yeah, years ago. Okay, cool. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do tomorrow is obtain a estimated seller net sheet because I want, you might assume that there's some costs involved with the sale of the property. But I want to disclose and show you as much with much clarity as possible what these costs are and show you at least an estimate. Because um, I don't want my, I don't like my clients to have a surprise or a cow later. So get in the habit of doing that. Video unavailable. Trade that replaces GFE. Yeah, they keep. Re uh, Every now and then you're going to see changes in these documents. The bottom line is all of this is always done to protect the consumer as much as possible. Um, FHA, MVA, FHA, Federal Housing Administration. Uh, they were created in 1934. Um, FHA is widely recognized for ensuring the first long-term fully amortized mortgages. They were insuring mortgages. VA, Veterans Administration. VA loans are great. They were created in 1944. 
after the World War II, um, <clears throat> it was for housing of all the returning soldiers. These two agents continue to support people in buying homes today. Um, one of the big advantage of VA is VA loan is zero down payment. So it's 100% financing. As long as you have a job that supports the income to afford the mortgage payment, you are allowed that. Because many banks, man, can you imagine the risk the bank has without any down payment? Typically, 20% down payment is required for you to borrow money. Um, VA is allowed to get a loan without any down payment. It's a great program. FHA loans are the ones now that offer three and a half percent down payment. Uh, so, and the rest financing, low down payment. Um, also FHA credit score guidelines are easier to qualify than conventional loan. Uh, so you don't need stellar credit. So this FHA insured loans, that, that's where they, they, uh, they help more people be able to afford a home. So it's good for business. Um, how many of you live in an FHA, uh, a condo that has an HOA, an association, townhome or a condo? Uh, these HOAs have to be VA or FHA approved in order for the VA or FHA buyer to qualify for that purchase. We'll talk some more about that, just so you know. Purchase money loan. Purchase money loan versus refinance. Purchase money loan is the money you borrow to purchase, as it says. Uh, personal power probably can be negotiated. So uh, after each, this is one lecture, two slides online when you have i don't know how many of you have actually paid and signed in and registered for our class but uh, you will get access to the online portal complete the online quizzes go through the textbook material uh, and then online quiz the open book past that okay Stay on top of it. Um, a lot of people fall back, fall behind, and they never apply for any license ever. Yeah, they weren't meant to be. <laughs> okay, brain game, medium of exchange or means of payment? Money, well, cash. Uh, also referred to as RESPA. Uh, something Settlement Procedures Act. There we go, Real Estate Settlements Procedures Act. Fosters lending uh, millions of returning veterans after, okay. That's the VA. VA. Established in 1913, the Bankers Bank. What is the FAA? No, that's, that's quite. Federal Reserve System. Widely recognized for ensuring the first long-term fully amortized mortgage in 1934. FHA. FHA, Federal Housing Association. A home loan to purchase residential property. Purchasing money loan. All right, so what we have is the in-class, which is our Zoom session. Uh, when things return to uh, the classroom environment, it's going to be an actual in-class, probably everyone wearing a mask, sitting six feet apart, windows open or some stuff like that. Uh, that's the in-class plus the online is three-month program or $3.99 a month. 
uh, we covered the real estate practice principle in finance. It's a three month rotation. Um, if you guys start this month, you are together with the few months that started last a uh, few people that started last month and a few people that started two months ago. But it's independent where, when you jump into this cycle. Um, course starts every month. So in class plus online is three ninety nine. Online only one fifty four. If you get online only, you don't get the in class or the zoom nor the zoom. Um, to register, you go here carealtytraining.com, and then you pick whichever package you like. So this is a taste of what an in-class session is like. I will share a lot of the real life experience, which is different for everyone. Um, Question. Yes. The course videos, which would mean those are extra then is that added on to the 399 or the 399 is a culmination of everything? No, 399 is the in-class and online basic. And then these are the options. Okay. So 399, if you want the hard copy textbook, the big book. Right. Okay, that's extra. If you want course videos, that's extra. The course video is, uh, it's a class, in-class session that was pre-recorded. Um, so you can go even... back and review, right? You can basically go back and review. Yeah. If you're having issues. Uh, most of the time, you know, I bought the textbooks. <laughs> I never opened them. Uh, but, you know, I know students. Yeah, you got them already. Perfect. Um, it's a good source. I, I always keep them handy because it's a good, like a Bible. It's for reference. Um, everything is in there. And then the what, crash course videos. What is that, the crash course video? Crash course is, uh, let's say a lot of people take this three month program, uh, but because something happened in their lives or whatever, they never proceeded to take the license. So they could take a couple of months off and okay. they're like, okay, I need, I need a refresher. I, I take in the certificate. I have everything needed to send the application, but I need a, a, a crash course video like this that's what it is okay. uh, we also offer a three monthly uh, three month monthly payment program uh, the first payment is this second payment is that third payment is this. oh so 399 is the for the entire course yes yeah, it's much better than 1200 bucks or 900 <laughs> do you suggest that the videos would be extremely helpful i mean i have been back in college it's been a long time since i've been in college i was in the hotel industry so i'm familiar with some of it uh, but do you think that the course video would be the way to go i mean i'm not just out of college so you know mm. i don't have that fresh mind that my son has and everything as far as um you know, the studying and such. So do you think okay. the going over would be? Nah, just uh, online and in class. In class the, is- uh, The video, yeah. Yeah, just in class. Um, the 399 is typically the, it's all you need, basically. Really? Yeah. The books actually have like pretty good review as well. There's a little, review questions and um, but exercises been, to practice as well. Elizabeth, have you been into the ebook? Yes, I okay. logged on. I took my first quiz. I actually started with principles, so okay. whoops. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so then, that one book, that one book has everything you're learning in the class. That, there's three separate books, so for each each course. But um, yeah, I I, I particularly like to read the textbook. I'm, I'm in university, so yeah, that's kind of just my nature. <laughs> 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 yeah, I just kind of dive right in. 
No, yeah, there it's just different for everyone. Right. So, you know, it's like if you like watching videos, of course videos might be useful. Um I've I've signed up for things in the in the past, like, oh, that sounds useful. I get all mm -hmm. the stuff and I never open it and I never use it. Right. <laughs> so everything is great if you use it. Right. Um, if you don't, then no. Um, one of my uh, coaches, he, he always said, everything, anything works. Nothing doesn't. <laughs> exactly. Hey, does this work? Of course it does, if you do it. <laughs> cool. Um, payment system. Let's see. Where's my other window? Oh. Okay, it didn't crash. There we go. Um, we have three more slides to go through. Two, two. The last one is kind of long. The second one. So now, when you say slides, that's units in the book, correct? So technically, we'd be doing five units, or is that? No, it's different. OK. Uh, we have sessions. We have each session is a slideshow. And then each lecture contains two to three slideshows or sessions. Um, but that doesn't correspond really to the, the book. OK. OK. So do we sign up through you, or I mean, how do we? If we've decided this is what we want to do, we sign up for you. No, you sign up online, carealtytraining.com. CA, let's see. C realtytraining.com. Okay. So go there with your credit card. And that's where you sign in, serialtytraining.com. Yeah. Okay. And so, uh, you have like August 1st would be your first, the first Saturday and August would start the new. No, you could, you could, if you want to start now, um, I mean, you, you can sign in later, register later after we are done today. Uh, but you could put it as starting in July with finance. So, that's, so now this this meeting will happen reoccur every Saturday from ten to two. Yes. Okay. Um, in the Zoom sessions, Zoom sessions typically seem to go a lot quicker uh, because of less interaction and a lot of people are just no video, no participation. Um, right. In class, it's typically a four hour, three to four hour, with some break in between. Three Saturdays a month. And these are, are these mandatory or these are just at your own will? At your own will. You are paying, you paid for it already. Right. So this is a supplement to your online material. Your online material is pretty much all you need. The in-class is a supplement to that. So if you have questions, then there, you're like, would be the mentor that we would go to? Yes, yes. Whatever question you have about the online material, like, uh, hey, I've been getting this particular question wrong, and I don't know why. I think this is the answer. Why is this not the answer? Then right. that's, we can discuss here. You're and our guy. Okay. We'll benefit. <laughs> okay. Um, or things like, even if you're curious, hey, my neighbor's house is, there's a for sale sign on the yard, but I think they're priced it a little too high. What do you think? You know, kind of a conversation. We, we could have that too. I mean, I welcome any and all things related to real estate, directly or indirectly, uh, as topic of discussion in our in-class sessions. Um, because that... You have no idea how much value this gives to people. It's just to broaden your horizon. Um, and, and it heightens your awareness to what's surrounding you. There's so many people surrounding you today that could be having 
to sell their house pretty quickly. And you are not paying attention. Um, you see a couple that is going through arguments and, you know, moving out and moving back in. It's like, oh, my God, they're going to get divorced soon. Wait, do they own the house? Look it up. They, yeah, they own the house. Oh, they have pretty good amount of equity. Does she have the money to buy him out? Does he have the money to buy him out? I think they'll have to sell and split half half. Um, this is when you, you know, somebody got a hip surgery. They live in a two story house. That's not going to last. So are you aware of your surrounding of people that will have real estate needs? And it may sound like, oh, you're horrible. You're just uh, ambulance chaser or whatever. No, I am providing solution so that the people around me will have an easier life. When you're going through a divorce, you're going through a lot. And the last thing you want to think about is another issue. So what if you are the trusted person that both trust and they allow you to handle the sale of the property? They already have so much to deal with. Be that person. Come from contribution. Cool. So I suggest I go take a break. Okay. And you guys, I mean, you guys could take a break anytime, but... Uh, you need a break. <laughs> no, I just need to. I need to return a, a call. Okay. It's a buyer that is like, are we seeing this today? I was like, no. Timer. Where's my timer? I'm gonna start. Timer. Five minutes. Okay. It's gonna beep. I'll be back. Get your soda, coffee, or whatever. He didn't start the timer. I did. Oh, <laughs> there we go.
Hey, Greg, are you here? Still? Greg? Yep, I'm here. Okay, I missed your question here earlier. Your, with our licenses, where are we allowed to buy or sell real estate? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we can buy real estate as, as an agent and conduct our own uh, uh, as an agent only in California because it's a California license. Um, so I have friends in Pasadena. That's where I grew up. Yeah. Um, I live in Santa Monica. I figure I'd work out of here on the oh, yeah. west side. Am I able to also sell in Pasadena? Absolutely. Entire state of California. Oh, okay. Um, I sell for people. Yeah. The, I have... I have a listing in Ventura City, in Ventura County. Uh, I've sold in Riverside. I've sold in San Bernardino, Big Bear. How do you do that? How do you spell that? Um, what? Repro, repro. No, it's called Reciprocal. Where else? Mostly in the South Bay because this is where my office is. Sure. But yeah, I have clients everywhere. Okay. Yeah, I have property in um, the in Mono County that. Yeah, could do that too. So I had a, I have a dentist friend. His wife, uh, uh, the husband died, and the wife is the one that had to sell her house. They're in Carmel, mm -hmm. and. Uh, she called me and said, hey, I, I know you're not in Carmel, but can you help me? I said, yeah. Now, Carmel, it's a good distance from here. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah? Um, so I didn't feel that I could. It, it's really for her best interest that I service that listing. Mm -hmm. So I interviewed several agents in Carmel. And I have the questions I ask. And I get a feel for what the agents are like. I interviewed two agents. They were really good. And I had them call both agents. I interviewed them. And mm. she picked uh, one of them. So he was hired as the listing agent. He sold the house. And he sent me 25% of his commission. That was nice. So question also, is there, is there reciprocity across different states? When you have the license? Yeah, I can only practice real estate in California. You don't have reciprocity that goes across Nevada or other states? It's my husband. Yeah. He's had a question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you hear him talking? Yeah, That's yeah. <laughs> no, so I can't practice in Nevada, uh, but through my network, I know people in Nevada, and so I refer business to them. Okay. So it's like, so Darlene, let's say you and your husband want to buy a house in or sell a house in Nevada. Um, and I say, hey, I have a really good friend of mine that does business in that part of Nevada. Here, give him a call. Mm -hmm. And I hand you, hand you off to them. And they are now the ones, your agent, to handle the stuff for you there. Okay, uh, and there between there. that agent and I, we'll have a referral fee agreement uh, mentioning your names, the principals, um, the referral fee, the dollar amount or the percentage, typically 25%, 30%, depending on where and what it is. Um, that's typically how I handle. Okay, great. Thank you. Appreciate it. You know, through Facebook groups and also, like, one thing I really enjoy about my company, at Keller Williams, we have a yearly gathering called Mega Camp and another yearly gathering called the Family Reunion. And these are big events where real estate agents from all over the world gather together. These are all Keller Williams agents. And we mingle, we network, we exchange ideas, and you become good friends. Um, there is a good agent in North Carolina. She referred me a, a seller. So she, this agent in North Carolina, Monica, she has a big team of agents. They have a lot of listings. One of our agents was holding an open house. One of the open house visitors 
was from Irvine, California. Wow. So uh, the agent was asking, hey, uh, where are you guys from? Where are you looking to, uh, when you're moving? Da, da, da. Yeah, we're from Irvine. We have a job relocation. We have to sell our place in Irvine first, but we are here to visit the campus of the new uh, work. Uh, we thought we would check out what's available. So she says, you know what? You're gonna call, I'm gonna have one of my agents in Irvine call you. So the next day, Monica calls me, gives me the info. I called the to the husband and wife uh, in Irvine. Hey, I heard you were talking to Monica. So uh, let me, tell me more away. Oh yeah, end of the year, moving to uh, North Carolina for job relocation. And we got to sell our condo. So, okay. So like four months later, I ended up listing and selling the property for them. That's great. So again, Let's go back to what I said, like everyone you meet has a purpose in your life. It's how well do you nurture that relationship? Opportunities come and real estate is so crazy. You have no idea where the next piece of business is coming from. It comes from the least expected place. Mm -hmm. I go to this wine bar here in Redondo Beach called Friends of the Vine. Yeah, I know, I know it's very one. often. Have you been there? No, but I know what it is. I live okay. in Madonna, so. so I go there often enough where it's like cheers, you know, that bar. Everybody mm -hmm. knows your name. Mm -hmm. um, and this lady that comes there very often, um, she was really like, she looked really depressed. I'm like, man, are you having a, how was your day? How can you cheer you up? What's up? It's like, well, my mom passed away about a year ago and the house that she owns is now being occupied by her boyfriend at the time, the boyfriend from the time. They're not even married. The boyfriend is not on title. Only the wife, is, the mom is, but the mom is gone. It's in a trust. So she and her sister are the trustees, successor trustees. However, the boyfriend that moved in, put a restraining order on them. They oh, wow. can't touch the house. So they're going through this court case and it's just crazy. It's awful. Um, and so she's been dealing with all the attorney and things like that. So she was telling me that's what's going on. I said, okay, so what do you want to do? Do you want to kick him out and sell the house? I was like, yes, but I can't. I like, well, let me handle that for you. Oh, so you, you know, what if I find a buyer that is willing to just buy the property from you with the boyfriend there and let the new owner deal with the eviction? Because ah. the new owner, the, the guy doesn't have a rest restraining order on the, the new owner. The, for the new owner, it's going to be a squatter situation. <laughs> Call the cops oh, and right. And I said, the, the challenge is going to be, you're not going to get top value market price on the property. Oh. Who the hell wants to buy a property where there's a squatter, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah. Some, well, there we go. Some people do. Actually, that's another thing that we have to be aware. Real estate investors that make money are the ones that see opportunity where most people don't. In general, nobody wants to touch a property that has a squatter in place. But the ballsy ones, where they see opportunity, they'll go for it. And the pay is very good. So high risk, high yield, right? So you see, I was always super nice to her because she's this old lady, you know. And I guess it paid off. <laughs> so you never... Just be kind to everyone you meet. Any other questions? No. Institutional lenders for real estate financing. Am I sharing the right, do you see the screen? Okay, let's see. Uh, banks, 
So this is how it works. You have the borrower. We have the consumer here. They borrow money from the bank. The bank has limited funds. So the bank for borrows from another group called the savers. Uh, the savers deposit, they take the deposit money, give it out as loan, interest, repayment of the loan, interest, repayment of the loan. Um, so banks like Citi, Wells Fargo, even the big ones, they are playing the middleman. And of course, these big banks have their own funds as well, but they also tap into other investors' funds. Um, so these are the guys that underwrite and fund the loan. These are the primary mortgage bankers. Uh, selecting a lender. So these are the typical banks that we see all the time. Chase, Bank of America, Wells Fargo. Um, we see also direct lenders like Finance of America, North American Funding, um, where all they do is home mortgage. So as a real estate agent working with a buyer, uh, the buyer could either be pre-approved for a loan by their preferred lender, which is usually typically the bank where they've been banking for the last how many years, and they're loyal to their bank, um, a credit union, union where they get a really good deal, or they don't have a bank. So that's when they need our participation. Um, most of my clients, they, I usually run into people that already have their shit together. So they already have a bank they're working with. Um, my job is to, I see if it's good, then it's good. If it's something that one of my preferred lenders could do better, then I suggest, would you like a second opinion uh, kind of stuff. Um, and then I also have the cash buyers. So upon meeting your buyer, if they are already pre-approved with their own lender, would you recommend that they speak with your preferred lender also? Yes. Um, at a very minimum, I have two pre-approval letters. Uh, best case scenario, my lender offers a better product at a lower price than their bank. And it has to be a win-win, uh, a win for my client. If it's not, then it's not happening. Uh, purpose of the loan. Lenders offer a variety of loan products for purchasing and refinancing, or even to get cash out if you have a lot of equity. Uh, purchase money loan, again, is the loan to purchase the home. Um, refinancing is typically to replace the loan with a better loan, better term, typically lower interest rates. Uh, which lender do I recommend and why? What is it that makes that lender so valuable? How do I find a great lender? Um, what a great lender means to me is someone that has track record. A lot of people come to me and say, oh, I'm with Chase, nice to meet you. I've been doing loans for the last 20 years. We close on time every single time. And it's all verbal. I haven't seen anything yet. I'm not saying they're liars, uh, but I stay in close contact with them. But typically my favorite lenders that I have in my pocket right now are people that I met through as I am the listing agent. I'm representing the seller. The buyer's agent brought, let's say Elizabeth is buying a house. They have a lender. Let's say Greg is the lender for Elizabeth. And uh, my listing is a pre-foreclosure. I need to get this property sold before the foreclosure date. Um, but it's like inspections, negotiations, things got delayed a little bit. And so Greg being the lender that always thinks outside of the box. It's like, 
because I am on the one listing agent. Like, hey man, I need you to close on time. I need to close you actually sooner. Da -da 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 -da. And then Greg asked me, uh, well, what's, what's going on there in your end? I said, well, this is a pre foreclosure. The asset managers are pushing. And if we don't close it on time, they're going to foreclose and your buyer is not going to be able to get the house. So Greg says, who's the asset manager? I say, hey, yeah, it's with JP Morgan, Chase. It's like, oh, really? So Greg makes a few phone calls and they postpone the foreclosure sale. And then I find that out and I'm like, man, this guy is good. Okay, so I keep his number handy. Next time I have a buyer that needs a lender, hey, Greg, remember you, you did all that magic and you made it happen? Hey, I have another buyer here, go help him. This is how I refer people is when I see you did some miracle stuff. If you were just ordinary, you just did your job, that's what you were supposed to do anyways, okay? That doesn't impress me. Oh, we close on time every time. Yeah, you're supposed to. I am impressed by people that do above and beyond oftentimes. And at that time, Greg could have said, hey, it's off my, you know, it's beyond my control. Too bad. Oh, well. And he could have let the deal die. I could totally, that would be reasonable. I wouldn't fault him for that. But no, um, he went above and beyond. So that's the kind of crowd that I want to have in my team. And what I mean my team is people that I can rely on to bring value to my clients. So these are just one of the examples, and there are many, um, that I need you to be open-minded, to be aware of that kind of behavior so you can keep them uh, really close to you. Application, applying for a loan. Everything starts with filling out 1003 form. A credit report is ordered. Uh, the property in question is appraised. The underwriter reviews everything, checks the risk, uh, the borrower's financial, the 1040s, the W-2s, 1099s, all the different income supporting documents. Uh, they check against what other liabilities the borrowers have, and then the loan is approved or declined. Uh, approved in most cases. Loan conditions are met. Funds are sent to escrow. That's the funding. And then we record. Once you record, escrow closes. Escrow closes, you get your commission check. So types of lenders. Um, just in theory, just so you know, there are these types of lenders. We typically deal with commercial banks, credit unions, some savings and loans, typically credit union and commercial bank. This, these are the two that uh, we will deal mostly as we handle residential real estate. Uh, commercial banks are the all purpose lenders. Uh, they have the widest range of loans. Um, in general, there are exceptions. But in general, if you can rate your buyer as a, like rating in terms of income, asset, and credit, the higher they rate, the bigger the bank you can go with. The bigger banks have the horsepower to low, offer the lowest interest rate. But because of the low interest rate, in return, they want low risk. And these high rate, highly rated clients that we might have are perfect for that scenario. Uh, but not all my buyers are perfect like that. Some may have great income. Um, one of the big challenges I have, a good number of buyers that I work with and I have worked with in the past are typically medical doctors, physicians. Income is great, very secure income. Uh, but because of lifestyle, for whatever, because they drive Porsches and they like drinking and all that stuff, um, or divorced and have several girlfriends, <laughs> it's really difficult for them to save money. 
So there's no asset for down payment. Their credit is good, but income is good, but the asset is low. So it, it's not, you can't really rate them as high as someone that has all three. So you can imagine all combination. Um, in that case, these big banks might not really be the best shot for them. So we have to know these little things like in basic, in general terms, so we can recommend what's best for our client. Um, typically savings and loans, uh, they're the most flexible. Um, they're the ones that really started with this 20% down payment. Um, they also service VA loans. So da -da -da. life insurance companies, man, there's a lot of money in that group, in this group right here. <laughs> uh, 20, 30% of their assets invested in real estate loans. They prefer safety and long-term stability. Uh, today, they're more active in providing smaller loans, single family home loans, uh, by using mortgage brokers and bankers. So when uh, my borrower, my buyer, uh, is pre-approved by like, New American Funding or Finance of America, Homebridge, um, all these different mortgage brokers, a lot of the money is coming from these guys. Pension retirement programs. This is another source of money. They do a lot of student housing, I guess. Senior facility self storage. Credit unions, members have their benefits. Um, Navy credit union and different also like work uh, related credit union. They have really competitive interest rates. Um, the challenge for me so far has been, they all close, they, they perform what they, they're supposed to. The experience is not all that great though. Uh, through our real estate transaction, I'd like to stay in contact with the lender or the loan officer uh, on my speed dial. Um, you know, hey John, is the appraisal in yet? Um, I, I need to be able to talk like right away. Credit union is always a 1-800 number and the best way to reach the loan officer is an email. And the email reply is typically a couple hours to 24 hours. It's a pain in the ass. I, I see it as unacceptable, but if that's what my client wants because they're getting killer interest rates, then that's what I'll have to deal with. <clears throat> Mortgage brokers, third party originators. These are the uh, TPOs. TPO. Um, <clears throat> this group here, they have a lot of money available for lending. That's what they are really good at. These guys, they have some money available for lending, but they are consumer entities. So they they deal with the consumer. So they are really ready to do everything uh, from A to Z, dealing directly with the clients. When you want to tap into their assets, they don't have the A to, this, the A to Z service to deal with the consumer. That's when the TPO mortgage broker comes in to the picture, okay? Uh, you know, it's just like realtors. I represent uh, individual owners of homes and, and buyers. Uh, but a new construction development, they have their sales department. They deal directly with the buyer, okay? Because they have everything, all the showroom floor and everything. Um, so that's kind of like what mortgage broker is, just like a realtor. Uh, they are not institutional lenders. 
uh, but they'll handle everything for you. They package the loan for the lender and they get paid a commission. A promissory note, uh, a written promise, it's a note saying that I promise to pay this money back. Amortization table. The liquidation of financial obligation on an installment basis. A fully amortized loan is one that at the end of the term, if it's a 30 year loan, a fully amortized loan is paid off at the end of the 30 years. It's not an interest only. Uh, financing term, more financing terms, fixed rate loans, adjustable rate mortgage. Um, fixed rate loan is the typically uh, the common one used and the preferred. Again, nobody likes surprises. So if I lock in for a 30 year loan, I know for the duration of the 30 years, my monthly payment is going to be the same. It does not change. Um, Adjustable rate, payment changes according to the index. Um, still people, a lot of people use the ARM uh, products, five year, seven year, sometimes 10, um, typically because the introductory fixed rate is lower than the 30 year fixed. So for the first five years or seven years, I'm paying less as a borrower. And if I think that I'm not keeping this house for too much longer, then the adjustable rate might be the way to go. <clears throat> Lending institution that accepts deposit and makes loans. Uh, savings, financial, financial intermediary. They are all purpose lenders and used by many home buyers. These are the commercial banks. Um, okay, these are most flexible in the mortgage lending industry. Uh, savings and loans. Uh, they prefer safety and long-term stability. Uh, retirement, life insurance, life insurance company. Uh, monies are routinely collected from payroll deduction and are held in trust until they need a return. Uh, retirement funds. Pension. Oh, pension is another great thing. Fully repaid at maturity, uh, fully amortized loan. And party. No, no party. Yeah, hold on. I have a question. Yes. Do you deal with a lot of flippers? You know, they flip the homes. Uh, I don't, I don't now, not now. When the inventory, when it's a buyer's market, when the inventory is high, uh, that's when I used to work a lot with flippers. I was one actually. Oh, okay. Um, Right now, because there are more buyers than the inventory allows, uh, like the latest example I use all the time is my Mar Vista listing. I have a listing in uh, right by Venice, between Venice and uh, Maria del Rey. It's an old house, it's a fixer. I think 1.4 million will be a good price, pre-COVID. Um, it's an escrow now at 1.35. I had cash offers from flippers at 1.1. Oh, okay. Now, if my seller was in a situation where, dude, I got to sell my house really quick um, for whatever reason, right? Either foreclosure or, or divorce orders or something. Then they might be open to the idea of taking 1.1 cash, five day close and be done with it. But they have reserve, they moved out of the house, they have a new job, they, they're in Virginia now. Um, they'd like to get the property sold ASAP. However, they could go for a few months 
then why would they take the 1.1 million? Right. When there's somebody else willing to pay a lot more. So right now, the market is such that there are a lot more people willing to pay a lot more than any cash buyer. That's why all my flip clientele are just like not doing anything. They, they can't get a deal. Because um, you need profit, right? right. Um, I have flippers that actually will overpay just to keep their crew busy. They oh. buy something at 1.3. This one, they'll pay, they'll pay 1.3. <clears throat> Remodel or new construction. Keep the crew busy. Put it on the market at a price that where they would make profit. <clears throat> if it doesn't sell, they take it off the market, put a tenant in there. <clears throat> Getting some income. Mm -hmm. Get some cash flow. Get some cash flow. When the market changes again, and now they can make some money when by selling, that's when they put it on the market. But then you see the typical flipper does not have the horsepower, the cash to pull that off. The typical flipper is borrowing money to do the improvements. You have a hard money loan, I have to pay this off. I can't put a tenant in there. Okay. Right. Um, so those with money will make more money right now. Um, your typical flipper that doesn't want to put any of his money or her money and still make some money, uh, those will just have to take a break. <laughs> Thank you. Let's see. Next slide. Non institutional lenders. Really? Bankers versus brokers. Why is this beneficial to, if the loan is declined the first lender, the mortgage broker will submit the package to another lender for possible approval. Yeah, I've seen that happen. So when you're dealing with a commercial bank, it's one way and that's the only way. If you don't get approved because at the last minute you couldn't provide another extra $80,000 of reserve, and that was a lending uh, condition, then it's not going to go forward. Uh, if that had to happen while the mortgage broker, a TPO is handling, the TPO, the third party originator has access to different investors. They have different requirements. That is their job to find out and keep track of what these requirements are. Why is this beneficial to a buyer? Because that's the benefit. I mean, I've seen, uh, I witnessed in my transactions, I had a buyer that had divorce and her ex had filed for bankruptcy. And somehow the bankruptcy, her name was tied to the bankruptcy, but she was not really the one that filed for bankruptcy. So she was getting a loan and the lender started to make a big deal out of this bankruptcy. And I guess all it took was a phone call, a letter from the attorney saying that this bankruptcy was filed after the divorce was finalized. That's all they wanted to see. Had it been a commercial bank, it might not have worked because they have a stricter guideline. Hold on, let me close this window. Can you hear the, the alarm going off? Yeah. Okay. I guess they took it already. Um, mortgage broker, third party originators process. Uh, they're like financial agents between borrowers and lenders. They originate but do not underwrite. Uh, they package the loan. Uh, they are brokers not the lenders, the lender approves underwrites of funds and the loan, the loan at the close, not the broker. <clears throat> but the broker is the one that puts everything together. Um, the loan is funded in the name of the lender, not the broker. Uh, mortgage broker does not service the loan. 
the lender is the one that does. Mortgage broker coordinates the loan process between the charges on rich fee. Yeah. So they're still out there. I want to say half of my buyers are going through brokers. Half of my buyers are going bank directly. It's all over the place. It's just so you guys know the difference. It's not crucial, but it's just good to know. Um, mortgage banker, what is their role? Uh, mortgage companies. Uh, they originate the new loans. They assist mortgage lenders with collecting payments, periodically reviewing lenders' collateral. So provides a foreclosure for lender if necessary. Ah, seller financing. Who's familiar with seller financing? These days, I don't see seller financing much. Uh, it's also carry back. <clears throat> when a seller carries the paper on the sale, it's called a purchase money loan, similar to loan made by an outside lender. In a seller carried loan, the seller acts as the beneficiary and the buyer as the trustor. The funds are usually in form of loan that is secured by a trust deed in favor of the seller. Um, actually, let's, here's an example of seller financing. Chad, the buyer, makes an offer on a house owned by John who accepts an offer for $375. Chad is self-employed but is currently unavailable, unable to obtain a loan at a favorable interest rates. You know, self-employed, uh, it's, it's difficult from regular salary income. So John has no existing loans on the property and must sell as soon as possible. So he offers to carry back financing on a new first loan of $300,000. So all had, Chad has to do is put down $75,000. So $75,000 goes to John and the 300,000, there was no $300,000 cash needed here because the seller is the, the one, okay? Uh, that's the beauty of this. It cuts out a lot of unnecessary money back and forth. Um, and then typically, typically the terms of these Seller financing is, from what I've seen, I've never done one, but I've seen the following. Okay, Chad, you owe me now $300,000. Once you pay me the $300,000, I'll sign the paper and the house is really all yours. Until then, I have the rights. I'm the beneficiary of in the trust deed. Um, and this is how you're going to pay me the $300,000. For 10 years, you have 10 years to do this. For 10 years, you're going to pay me interest only. Uh, let's say the current rate is 4% from the most mortgage bankers. You're gonna pay me like a 6%, 7% a year, interest only. At the end of 10 years, you have to pay me 300,000 in full. So hopefully, John that is uh, self-employed, he has 10 years to figure out a way that after 10 years, he qualifies for a regular home mortgage where he could borrow $300,000 from a regular bank to pay off Chad. No, no, John. Make sense? That's how it works. All right. A commission of 1% or on, on the loan amount charged by a retail lender. I think it's called the points. Points, origination fee or points. Uh, who approves underwrites and funds the loan at closing? Not the broker, the lender. The lender is the one. Um, they originate, but do not underwrite or fund the loan. They originate TPO. Uh, when a seller carries the paper on the sale of his own or her home. Seller carry. Seller carry, seller finance. Yeah. 
uh, when a loan is funded, it is funded in the name of the lender, not the mortgage broker. The carryback loan, they are considered the beneficiary, the seller, the lender. Okay. Quick progress. Do we party yet? One more. One more and we can party. Uh, what is your definition of party now? Today it's eat lunch. <laughs> yeah, true. What's for lunch? Uh, meatloaf, not meatloaf, pork chops. On the grill? No, don't have a grill. I'm in an apartment. That's okay. why I'm studying so hard to be a realtor. Okay, to get out of the apartment. Yeah. Awesome. You got this. Um, yeah, after this, I'm going to go for an early dinner. Actually, no, you'll be regular dinner. You'll probably end up being a rosé all day. That turns into dinner. It's almost one o'clock. Yeah. We're sheltering at home, and our latest project is watching all the Marvel comic movies in order. Or, or study for a real estate license. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that too. I thought that's what this was. Yeah, this is. Um, you know, the sheltering at home, stay home order, um, I don't think is much going on now because on the freeway, the traffic is really bad. Sure. Um, in the beginning, oh my God, the 405 was empty. It was just. Uh, I want COVID traffic back. Yep. Yep. <laughs> For sure. Uh, we still have the COVID without the traffic, uh, with the traffic now. That's. Uh, I, uh, all my clients were musicians. So my whole business has just gone down the drain because nobody can perform. Yep. Yep. Yeah. My violinist daughter, um, she's just out of work. Mm -hmm. All she's doing now is, uh, administrative stuff to like, you know, musical library kind of, you know, businesses and school things. Yeah. No, everybody. So here's, okay. Think about this. Because of the coronavirus, a lot of people's income has been affected. Uh, when you buy a house, you typically have savings for your down payment, uh, some savings for your reserve, and you qualify because you have a good job. But let's say your good job or job is now being somewhat affected by the virus, either reduced pay or uncertainty of how long you have the job. So a lot of buyers are like, oh man, we can't buy anything right now until I see some sense of security and um, projectable future. I'm not buying a house anymore. So a good number of buyers have gone off the market. That's true. Um, but still, there's tons of buyers that still haven't been affected at all by the coronavirus. Um, so for now, it is affected, but but not a, it's not in a, a, a panic alert kind of uh, a, a mode. That's what's going on. So these are the things that constantly watching the news and kind of like relating to our own situation. We have to be able to come to certain conclusions like this to, you know, because a lot of times, hey, how's the market? Uh, Depends. Why do you ask? <laughs> I mean, oftentimes they just want to ask for to make conversation, but you got to be able to provide a, uh, a knowledgeable insight. Little by little, these conversations is what's going to build your image in your circle as the knowledgeable go-to person. Okay. The answer can't be, how's the market? Oh, market is great. And just, that's it. You have to be able to elaborate in a meaningful conversation. And the more crafty, uh, skillfully you can do this, the more respect and admiration you will get from your circle, the more referrals you're going to get. Um, all right. So we got conventional loans and PMI. PMI, mortgage insurance. If the down payment is less than 20%, typically PMI is needed. 
Less than 20% means lower, uh, higher risk. Um, so the FHA loans were the 3.5% down payment. The PMI is already part of the, uh, the mortgage. If you don't want PMI, more down payment. Uh, mortgage insurance, a mortgage guarantee insurance that protects conventional lenders in case of default. Um, this is how they calculate private mortgage insurance. Half a million dollar loan, 0.75 divided by 12, that per month. I don't know. I don't know if this is, it's different for every bank. Every time I see this PMI number is always something meaningful and significant. Um, it's like a lot of people don't like it, but still there's no other option. They can't come up with more down payment. Uh, I've seen banks that do, <clears throat> you do 10% down, you borrow another 10% from another bank as a, just a second loan. Now you have 20% down. You get the, the, the mortgage, no PMI, because now it's 20%. But now you have to pay interest on the second loan. So I don't know if it's beneficial. You just have to do the math. But there are crafty ways that people are doing it to minimize um, your expense. Okay, conforming loans and non-conforming loans. Oh, we don't talk about non-conforming. Conforming loans. Uh, they have the terms and conditions that follow the guidelines set by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. These loans are called the A paper loans, also prime loans. <clears throat> full documentation, full doc. It requires two years tax returns, verification of income, deposits, um, employment. Requires high credit score and clean credit history. So these are the A buyers. Uh, and once you meet that guideline, you can use the conforming loans. So, and the, oh, this is the big one. Debt to income ratio. If your monthly or yearly income is 10,000, this debt to income ratio will limit you to like 40%, I think. 4,000 can be used for mortgage. That's the loan you're gonna qualify for. If you want to borrow more, then you're gonna go with the non-conforming loans. Uh, this debt to income ratio changes from time to time. I've seen as high as like 50%. No, ching, ching, a ling. Changing hmm. what? No? Ching, ching, a ling. Yep. <clears throat> Did I get that right, Elizabeth? Whoever said that? No, and I think there were. Uh, what was the alarm on the truck? Um, so these are principal lenders use. Uh, to evaluate the risk. Uh, if the borrower makes a small down payment or has marginal credit, the guidelines are more rigid. If the borrower, so yeah, this is all high risk, uh, low risk uh, related stuff. Obviously the higher the risk, the less uh, things are more expensive for the borrower. Debt to income ratio. A uh, typical conforming loan uses 36% back ratio. FHA, 43% back ratio. Front ratio is, I think, mm, I think back ratio is what really matters. So here's it, okay. The percentage of consumers monthly gross income that goes towards paying debt. Lenders use two calculations, front and back. Front ratio, percentage of borrowers monthly income they used to pay 
monthly mortgage, tax, and insurance. But what if he has a Bentley on a lease and that's more than the mortgage? That has to be taken into account. So the back-end ratio does that. Back-end ratio is the one that takes into account all the recurring debt, credit card, car payments, uh, school loans, child support, all the different expenses, liabilities that they have, plus the mortgage, tax, and insurance. And that cannot exceed 36%. That's very conservative. Um, this is another thing that a lot of people uh, quickly forget. Um, a lot of realtors walk around and asking people, hey, do you rent? Yeah, how much do you pay rent uh, per? Oh, I pay $4,000. Oh, did you know $4,000 you could buy a blah, blah house? It's like, yeah, I know that. But I only make $4,500 a month. I pay $4,000 in rent and I live off $500. See, if that is the case, yes, you can afford the $4,000 payment, but you won't qualify for a mortgage. Subprime loans, loans that do not meet the borrower's credit. Those are the B and the C paper loans caused by either low credit scores or no credit rating. Uh, they have good credit, but debt to income ratio exceeds the limit. So, you know, my example, $5,000 a month, uh, $4,500, you know, $500 extra a month, uh, you would have to pay a higher rate. Uh, subprime loans were very popular right before the bubble. Uh, so that's what caused all of that stuff. Um, the bubble, 07, 08. Do you think that the rise of subprime loan in the lending industry was the reason for market crash? Yeah, I guess. Looks like it. This were, uh, these were loans that were given out to people that could not really afford to borrow um, money. My second house I bought, I bought in stated loan, stated loan, stated income loan. Uh, I own my own business, so I didn't really have much of the 1040 to prove my income. Um, so I bought a house, I, I, I was like nine, 9% 9 interest rate. This is a long time ago, but still it was a, it was a high interest rate. Um, eventually I sold and bought a different house and that house I bought a regular, regular loan, not, not the stated income. Predatory lending, lending practice where lenders pressure borrowers into signing loan documents. Uh, this doesn't happen much anymore. You know, these are lenders that know that you can't pay, but they lend you money anyways because they want to foreclose on you. That's predatory lending. Uh, FHA was created in 1934. It was created to stabilize the mortgage market. They do not make loans. Uh, they insure loans. Federal housing. Uh, so they look at the income, the credit history, work history, funds for closing, uh, monthly housing expense. Uh, they also look at minimum property and constru construction standards for the, res the residential property. Um, I think one of the first things that I noticed between these property condition guidelines on a conventional non-FHA loan, uh, if a room had a little piece of paint peeling, it would not be a big deal. But for an FHA loan, that was uh, an issue. No peeling paint allowed. Benefits, 30-year amortized fixed rate, uh, low down payment, um, they insure the loan, because of this added insurance, the lenders could take a little higher risk. So uh, lower down payment. Uh, minimum property standards, 
so this gets the borrower to get a better standard uh, property. Uh, three and a half percent down, hundred percent down for family members. Oh, FHA allows hundred percent of down payment to come from a gift. I call that the I love your bank. You know, you have family and friends that, hey, can I borrow 10,000? Can I borrow 10,000? You borrow 10,000 for a few people, suddenly you have 100 grand and you can buy a house. Um, they have competitive interest rates and it's easier to qualify. The minimum FICO score is 580. 580 to qualify for FHA. They look at income. Uh, they look at the employment, most two recent years. Three and a half for five, 80 FICO, 10% down required if it's less than 580. They have maximum loan limits. Depending on the county, it changes. The VA loan, um, 29 million veterans, no down payment. Indian qualification, no PMI. Um, the VA is not allowed to pay for a lot of the things like termite. A VA buyer is not allowed to pay for termite. Um, it's very beneficial. Um, you need to, oh, these are the requirements. Eligible. All veterans are eligible 90 days active service or meet other qualifications. Honorable discharge is okay. Active service within designated periods. Veteran receiving approved medal. Unmarried spouses of veterans killed in active duty are also eligible. Okay, a mortgage guarantee that protects conven conventional lenders from default. PMI. The typical down payment necessary to avoid paying PMI, 20%. The percentage of borrower's monthly income that is used to pay uh, front end debt to income ratio. Persuading a buyer to agree to a loan they cannot afford to pay back, predatory lending. 30 year fixed loan with three and a percent down payment. This is the FHA loan. Uh, no down payment, no PMI, no repayment, no nothing. <laughs> VA. VA is where it's at. Um, we're done for now. Uh, live scan. We offer live scan. Live scan is that super high end fingerprinting of uh, uh, the, the entire head. Uh, why is it uh, necessary? It's sent to DOJ, Department of Justice, for your background check. Um, that's it. Okay, now it's party time. You can go. Party. Oh, you can party. <laughs> We're like feed the cat. <laughs> All right, any questions, anybody? I bet you'll do it. I have a, a, it's not about the finances. Mm. Um, you mentioned that flippers hire, a, a, they just fill the house with a, a renter. Mm -hmm. um, where do you find those people that uh, know how to, I mean, are there management companies that can place the ad for you and everything? Yeah, as a realtor, I do that. Mm -hmm. So um, I have, I work with, uh, buyers, sellers, and investors. And depending on, you know, my clients that have just a few doors, they rely on me to market the property for rent, find tenants for the property. Mm -hmm. uh, when you have multiple doors, many properties, uh, it will be beneficial to you as an investor to hire a property management company. Mm -hmm. But these flipper scenario, it's one at a time. So it's Oh, I don't, yeah, I'm not flipping. I'm more interested in getting a, 
property. Property management. Yeah. Thing. Okay. Yeah, property management is also something you can do uh, with real estate license, uh, but then you need to be a broker mm-hmm. or hang a license with the broker that allows property management. Um, I, I mean, you do whatever you want to do. I typically talk people out of becoming property managers. <laughs> um, when I first started, my one of my mentors told me, hey, ho, you know, if you love people, you help people buy and sell, you'll become a realtor. When you hate people, you become a property manager. Yeah. <laughs> I did. I, I, I just can't. Um, especially now with the coronavirus, a lot of people are using it as excuse for delaying rent payment uh, or not paying at all. And so I have some investors like panicking. Um, and there's nothing they can do. They can't evict for non-payment at this moment. Mm. Um, yeah, these are the risks of real estate investment. Easy times. It's nothing, nothing is really easy. <laughs> All right, anybody else? Any comments, questions? No. Nothing? I hope you got some valuable information today. Yes, appreciate and, your time. Thank you, sir. And uh, for next week, please get in the habit of, okay, so I want you now, now that you're into, embarked in this journey of real estate, I want you to now be more aware and sensitive about anything and everything real estate evolving around you. And it should make you curious. And curious in the sense that I wonder how this works. I wonder why this, why that, okay? Take note of all that and bring it to our next meeting, okay? It's always fun discussing things like that, okay? Thank you, sir. Have a good weekend. Have a fun weekend. You too. Take care. Bye-bye. All right. Later, guys. Thank you. All right, all the people that didn't log off. <laughs> Let's see, any questions here? Uh, presentation, nah, no access to presentation. You don't really need it anyways. Um, I think most of the stuff we talk about, you're going to just retain because it's just Real life. Anyways, all right, go on about your day. I'll see you guys later.